You don't need a forty thousand dollar lathe. You don't need a six thousand dollar torch. You don't. You know what I mean? You need heart and hand skill. This is the Wise Guy Radio Show, a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist, retail owner, or enthusiast. We have a ton of fun in store for you. Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by American Helix. The American Helix is a revolutionary new concept in smoking technology. Designed and manufactured by American glassblowers, this pipe is light years ahead of its time. Based on Brunoli's principle, the shape of the pipe along with an innovative intake system creates a venturi effect through precision micro holes in the chamber, which results in a slower burn that conserves tobacco and gives a smooth, refreshing smoking experience, making the American Helix the smoothest hitting pipe on the market. For further info or to locate their products, you can find them online at AmericanHelix.com. That's AmericanHelix.com. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Zen Glass Studios. Located in the heart of St. Petersburg, Florida, Zen Glass has a wide range of offerings to choose from. Their menu includes one-on-one or group classes in their hot shop or flame working studio, create your own wine glass, and so much more. If you're a traveling artist, they even have a space to rent that you can temporarily call home. With over 50 years of combined experience, Zen Glass can help you fine-tune your techniques, whether you're a novice or advanced glass artist. For their calendar of events, including info about their third Thursday studio jams, you can contact Zen at zenglass.com. That's zenglass.com. Hey, what's happening? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode 161. This is your host, Jason Michael, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today's episode features Chris of Sensi Glass, that is at S-U-N-S-Y Glass on Instagram. You can check him out on all the social feeds, and uh, also check him out on Facebook at Chris Aus, A-U-S. And uh, this conversation was a lot of fun. Chris started his early beginnings back in the late 90s uh, and was scared off from Operation Pipe Dreams and was uh, going back to law school and decided to just recently get back into the glass scene. Um, so he does have a lot of different backgrounds. We get into the, t- the topics of conversation about all kind of things from copyright talk, it's, uh, some similar stuff we talked about with Luke Zimmerman, but really just about from a perspective of a glassblower. Um, but we really get into a whole lot of stuff because he came back into this industry um, right basically you know, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, I guess it was. Um, maybe, maybe a little bit a little bit longer than that. But anyways, um, you know, there's been so much that has changed in the last five years, much less 10 years. And uh, it's been about as long as he's been out for. So this is definitely an interesting conversation, kind of a fast forward through time from what was like in the late 90s to where we are now and the way things have changed. And it's just, it's, I'm still uh, just trying to catch up myself. So, <laughs> oh man. But we go, before we go any further and get this started, I have to start off by giving a huge shout out to uh, our beta test group who is involved in the first testing of our online course. Um, these guys have been instrumental into helping me get a, a leap and jump start on this on this online courses. Uh, I was able to buy a new laptop for myself. So I'm, this is actually the first show I'm editing on the laptop, which I'm just super fucking pumped about and just so grateful for you, the community, everybody that's involved in this. I got to just, just give all my love out there. But really right now I want to thank uh, the three guys. You guys should follow these guys on Instagram too. You can get a chance to see their growth as they go through the course as well. And then it might interest you and you want to come on board and take our first class. Um, you can find these guys on Instagram again at Note Glass, N O T E Glass. Uh, you can find also Dobby Wan, is Dobby, D O B B Y underscore W A N underscore, underscore Glass. And then we have Gizmo Glass, G I Z M O Glass. I'll have their links in the show notes. Definitely give these guys uh, some love uh, for helping myself out, which then helps out you, the community, and this, and the audience here listening to the show. Because um, that's what they're going to be doing is through the beta test is help me work all the bugs and kinks out, uh, what works, what doesn't work, uh, get some really honest feedback. And they are paying to be involved in this, which for me is also a huge deal. 
you know, it's always something like even with our glass, you know, you make, make something new and you're not really sure if anybody's going to be even interested in it. And doing something like this and putting myself out there as a teacher and offering something brand new that's never been done in a format the way I'm doing it. I mean, there's obviously there's all kind of shit ton of online courses, uh, but the way I'm going to be offering this class is completely unique and different. And having this platform as a podcast has been one way to help get the jump start. But really, it's taught me everything on how to do this audio. I mean, I'm, I can ramble on for three days about it. But uh, really, what this whole thing is, is by getting this going, uh, this is just going to be the beginning of years of online courses and series and things that are going to teach uh, basic, simple, traditional, foundational techniques and uh, all kind of stuff so that you can go then watch an online course like a Dustin Revere class or go take a course from somebody like a Blitzkriega or a Joe Peters or a Yushin or whoever out there is offering a course, you'll have a foundation skill set that you can take and then go take these classes. Um, the first class we're going to be offering, I don't have an exact date right now. I'm looking at July for the launch, but it's going to be a Critters and Creatures and uh, it's going to be base, a basic uh, sculptural technique kind of class, which is what these guys are going to be taking. And we'll be posting pictures and stuff. And uh, so we're all super, super excited about it. So again, give these guys some love. You can find them on the show notes. Just uh, usually for, depending on what kind of system you have, you can just touch the logo, the image of the on the iPad or the, uh, I'm exhausted, so sorry. <laughs> but on the logo for the podcast and then they're on the other side of that thing. So there you go. Um, yeah, so I'm pooped. It's like one o'clock in the morning here right now. I gotta get the show out because this is almost the last day of May. I want to make sure we kick off our June class or June series of courses with this episode. Um, I was hoping to have had on JD Mabel's in last week. We had a schedule conflict. Uh, he went down to Columbia for a festival glass event down there. When he gets back, we're definitely gonna be doing this. Um, but uh, before the show starts, I want you guys to first check out the trailer for his new uh, series, new documentary. Uh, we first talked about his last interview called Vagabong. Um, it's an incredible 30-minute documentary uh, that he has out, and this is just the trailer for it. And this is the audio version. He gave me permission to pull some stuff out of it, so I wanted to make sure uh, you got a little idea and a teaser on what this is. And then when he comes back on, we're going to talk about the actual documentary. Um, there's been two uh, releases so far, and then we're going to talk about how you guys can get your hands on this documentary because, again, it is badass. It's well done. It's totally different from um, from when Degenerate Art came out that Slinger did. And it's cool to see... Uh, this whole concept of being able to travel and live the life you want to live on the road as being a glass artist. Uh, the next month of June is all about how to market and sell your glass. And that's why I wanted to bring Chris on because Chris has having gone from being involved in the glass scene for uh, several years and then getting s pretty much scared off because of legalities and federal uh, people putting their fingers where it doesn't belong. And then inspired from what's been going on with not only this podcast was something that inspired him which that was awesome but also the way the community has grown so much so we get a lot into marketing talk and the month of june is dedicated to selling your work and we're going to be doing these series and sequence to help you grow as an artist help you find out how to make what you want to make how to become inspired to live the life you want to live and then how are you going to take this life you want to live and support it with your glass and that's what this month of june is all about so enjoy this documentary uh, or the trailer i should say for the documentary Enjoy this episode with Chris, interview with him as well. And don't forget to thank our sponsors, everybody out there. Give them some love. And we'll talk to you on the next episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. Take it easy. Talk to you soon. Love you so much. See you. We're brought together by the pipe. We have fun. We do charity events. We do all this stuff because we don't have to. We do it because we love to. When I was 12 years old, my parents bought me a teeny tiny torch for Christmas and I fell in love. I've been blowing glass for so long when I work, I feel the flame come out of my chest and I feel like it's just part of me. I'm excited to say that I have people in my generation picking up the flame. The moment I started blowing glass, all I wanted to do was just play with hot glass and the flame no matter what it took. It allows me to have the opportunities to travel and see the world, which is all I've ever wanted to do. I just want to do it more and more. And it's, I guess, maybe a little addictive. I think really anything that you're making with intention, with heart and soul, with purpose, that's art. When we throw gallery shows, people are experiencing the art that they buy, and their friends are experiencing it. That kind of creates a bigger connection to the object for people, I think. 
when you get all these people together, you kind of feed off each other's energy, and you probably do work a little bit harder. You get inspired. The hardest thing about being a pipe maker is dealing with the stigma of being associated with something that was considered immoral. We weren't mainstream. We worked in our garages making product to go and sell it in a parking lot. My idea of the American dream is exactly what we're doing, living our life as we choose. We want that validation. We want to be like the best degenerates we can be, but we still want people to look at it and be like, whoa, these guys work hard. Man's inhumanity to man, all those things cause complication and creation, see? The domination of one nation to another nation, all those things cause complication, see? Hey, Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, Jason, how you doing? Pretty good, man. It's good to finally talk to you here. And, uh, awesome, yeah. Thanks so much for your time. I'm excited to spend a few hours with you or however long it takes to share my story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. So, uh, yeah, before we get all kind of sidetracked here, if you want to start us off with your origin stories and how you got behind the torch. Absolutely. So we'll go back, back in the day. It's, it's kind of a phrase that I'll probably repeat many times during our conversation, but right. back to ni 1998, 1999, uh, those were my formative years. So I, I was a college student at a liberal arts university in, in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, and I had a mutual friend who was starting up a small glass blowing company, um, and I had zero experience with glass. I had, you know, we started to see these functional glass pieces kind of coming from the West Coast, kind of taking the place of metal pieces and ceramic pieces. So we, we, we'd seen these glass pieces kind of arrive on the scene. Um, but I had this opportunity to join up with four or five other people locally here in Minneapolis and um, kind of be on the front edge of glass blowing, at least in, in Minnesota. So it was very serendipitous. It was kind of by chance. I was actually drawing and doing piercing at a local tattoo shop at the time. And I was kind of looking for something else to do. So I had this wonderful invitation to join this group of guys. And really, that's how it started. There was four or five of us working in this little loft in um, Minneapolis. And the owner of the company at the time would fly out this guy. His name was Chris Cannon. He was a glassblower from California. And I forget what area he was from. But Chris would fly out, and he'd show us you know, simple text. He taught us how to wrap and rake. He taught us very basic shapes in terms of pinches and spoons and really laid out the groundwork for all the basics of functional glass. And he'd come out and he'd show us reversals. Um, and when I saw those first spirals, I mean, that's what really blew my mind. And I knew from day one, I knew that's what I want to do. I want to be a line worker. That's, that's my identity in the glass world. So yeah, it started back in 1998, 1999, um, with this group of four or five people at um, yeah at a at a small local company. Now it was interesting because I knew after about a year of being there that you know maybe this isn't the place that I want to be in terms of who I'm aligning myself with. These people, like some of the artists, there were great, but the owner eh, maybe left a little bit to be desired. So <laughs> I, I made the decision to to fly solo. You know, I had just I had just finished college and and it was interesting because I was gonna go to law school. I went I went to the school with ambitions of being a lawyer. So all the coursework, everything I took was was to kind of gear me up for going to law school. Well it was interesting during that final year of, of college I got a girl pregnant. Um, and we're still together to this day. We've been together almost 20 years. But um, so my senior year of college, I realized, holy crap, I'm going to be a father. This is, 
it's an amazing thing. It motivates you to make these really substantive choices. It, it really compels you to like to get out, get after it, right? Yeah. Do something with your life. So, so I had to make this choice. Okay, am I going to go to school? Do I have time for another three years of school? Can I encumber my family with you know a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt, or should I take a risk? Should I start my own company? Should I be a glass blower? Um, and I chose the latter. I chose um, taking that risk. And it was awesome. So I flew solo. I brought a friend with me, and I said, here's my vision for the company. This is what I want to do. If you're on board with me, I'll give you 50% of the company. Let's see what we can do. Um, and it was really that simple, that spontaneous, that organic. And we just started in my garage, you know, in this fucking shitty two-car garage. We started building our first glass blowing studio. Um, very quickly, that little garage turned into a 2,000 square foot shop that morphed into a retail store. And the next thing you know, we've got a 6,000 square foot shop and we've got 12 employees and we've got this really, really thriving wholesale and retail business. And it was awesome. So really it was in the matter, within the course of a year or two, I went from knowing nothing about glass to being a store owner uh, you know, a shop owner, <laughs> yeah. having this really thriving wholesale business, having employees, really with no experience either, no experience as being a business owner. Um, but but we just had the love. We had the love for glass, and that's what was really important for us. And really, that served to fuel us, um, you know, in those formative years. So yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> have yeah, you always, have you always had of, like a drive for the business side of things, like as an entrepreneur? Yes, absolutely. So. Back in the day, again, using that, this is the second time I've used that. Um, I did. I knew I wanted to be a, a store owner. I, I loved business, but I certainly, like, I, I didn't know shit. Yeah. I didn't know shit. I, I look at it now uh, with, you know, it's a function of age, right? We mature. We, we acquire tons of knowledge. I'm 38 years old now, and I look back, and I see all these mistakes that I made, and I really wish I could revisit some of these choices I made. And, you know, it's this if-then type scenario. Oh, if only I could have done this, I could have done better. But to answer your question specifically, absolutely. I've always been interested in the business side of the equation as much as the art side of the equation. And, and we'll talk more and more about this. Um, but I, it, it's so important to have some... You still with me? Yep, I got you. Okay, cool. Great. Someone's someone's uh, chiming in. It's like, great. Per perfect timing. <laughs> and of course, it's like a solicitor, too. It's like, leave me alone, solicitor. Yeah, exactly. Anyways, business is so important. It's so important. And we'll talk, we'll talk more about that. But in my formative years, when I first started, I made many, many mistakes. And it's okay to make mistakes. You just got to learn from them. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I can tell you now that... Now that I've been back in the game for about, uh, let's say, the last eight months, looking at it with a fresh set of eyes and, and, and a different skill set, um, I'm not going to make those mistakes again. Um, and, yeah, it's super cool. I love business. Business is so important. We'll talk more about that. Yeah, fuck yeah. Yeah, I definitely want to cover that because myself personally, too, like doing this for 18 years, I've had studios, whether it was with a business partner or on my own and had employees and, you know, et cetera. And it's like, there's so many ways of going about doing it, but it's like, it seems like with our industry, it's, it's so easy to overthink it to where it's like, it's, it's harder just to simplify things, but it's such a simple concept of a business. I mean, it's like basic manufacturing and overhead and costs, et cetera. Keep your yep. books easy, have a tax accountant, blah, blah, blah. You know, it, it, Exactly, exactly. And so I think a lot of people, you know, we're, we're artists or we're craftsmen, depending on how you, how you view yourself. A lot of people could, could really benefit from just a very basic fundamental understanding of business, business 101. Mm -hmm. um, and, and all of that knowledge is available now. You don't have to go to a school and learn that. You can sit down and you can educate yourself, whether that's online or at a library or defer to an expert, right? Build a team around you of people that have these certain skill sets so yep. they can kind of guide you in that direction. That's super important. Um, I will say that, th so my, my career in glass has kind of had two phases, right? So we had that early, those early formative years from... 98, 99 till about 2004, 5 when I actually walked away from glass. Okay, so that's kind of my first, my first little time in the industry. I left. I walked away for 10 years plus, and I just recently got back on the torch back in June or July, and we can talk about what went into that. 
But where I'm going with this is that so much has changed in the industry in terms of how you can apply a business model to your business, right? To to, yeah. to what you do. So very basically, let's let's think about this. Um, back in 1998, this is pre-social media. Okay, this is fucking even pre-cell phones. I think I yeah pre-YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> right? So pre-social media, pre-glasspipes.org. So what did we do to uh, develop our business? We Old school farming, just the very classic methodology of the business. We would make phone calls. We would go and drive to stores. We would press the flesh, shake hands, make introductions. This is very old school, classic business. It's kind of a model that doesn't really apply as much today, but it's still very important. I think it's still, it's still useful, oh, yeah. but that's all, that's all we had back then. <clears throat> so what, you know, you, you would kind of do this map of, okay, this store is located here. This store is located here. you physically drive there with your stuff in a gun case and you would hope that the owner is there because the owner is never answering the phone anyway mm -hmm. so many many times you're just going out there kind of planting seeds versus actually shaking them down for dollars you're not really <laughs> good luck I yeah. mean, good good luck taking your case to a store and actually emptying that case and leaving with a check and if you do leave with a check you damn well hope that thing cashes because, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know it was just so it was just so different now we fast forward to today okay we have so many different arrows in our quiver that we can use to successfully build a business and market ourselves we have social media right? That is so huge. We didn't have that, but people underestimate how powerful that is. Okay, let's think about this. Last month, Facebook had 1.8 billion active users. That is a shitload of people. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Instagram, Instagram had 700 million active users. Twitter, 300 million, right? Those are active people. Those are fish ready to nibble on your hook. So social media is an incredibly powerful tool for anyone getting started to you know, to build their brand, to mm -hmm. let people know who they are. You can't underestimate that. Yeah. Now, secondly, we have that old school way of farming, whether it's picking up the phone and calling a shop owner. You're like, yo, I saw you on Instagram. I absolutely love what you do. And guess what? I would be honored to have my work featured in your gallery, right? Some people will actually respond to that because it's such a, such a classic way of doing business. Those, those people are still out there that prefer snail mail. They yep. prefer pen and paper, right? So that's another arrow in your quiver um, that you can use. Um, and then last summer, or excuse me, last fall, I got my first exposure to trade shows. Now trade shows, everybody knows what they are, but trade shows specific to functional glass are amazing. I could have never imagined that these things would have even existed back when I first started in 98, 99, right? Mm -hmm. we, were, we were degenerates. We, really, we were not looked at as 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 being people that you know, you know we're good people we were outlaws it was like it was so crazy it was such a different time so fast forward to now you have trade shows you've got you've got champs and age and then in the midwest here we have a show that i really love called glass roots and that's again in october of of every year in madison wisconsin and it's specific to you know pretty much american-made artists and it's such a great way to get your work in front of people meet those buyers shake their hands build those relationships um be present in the community. I mean, we didn't have that back in 98, 99, but with the advent of trade shows, oh my goodness, it just, it's incredible. Yeah, um, it really so the, is. The, yeah, so the business has grown by leaps, leaps and bounds. And, and people like yourself and, and people that have been there from those formative years and have really walked walk this road start to finish to where we are right now, not finish, but present, you've seen those changes. Whereas I, I stepped away for 10 years um, and I, yeah, I didn't walk that road with you guys. So it was really, really eye-opening to come back and to see all of the changes that have taken place. And I guess I want to encourage people now, if you're starting, um, take advantage of all of these resources that are out there, whether it, again, social media, old school, classic farming, um, trade shows. Of course, there's other ways, but you guys, there are so many tools at your disposal to help you build your brand and to help you be successful. Um, 
that doesn't mean it's easy though. There's the caveat. Yeah, it doesn't exactly. mean that it doesn't mean you're going to open an Instagram account and boom, the money's just going to start, you know, filling up your PayPal account. Quite, quite the opposite. I mean, there's, there's definitely a certain amount of nuance and, and understanding that you have to have um, in order to be successful on social media. And we, we yeah. can talk more about that stuff too. Yeah, man. Yeah, I, I agree. And it's, it's interesting too, the dynamic we have now with, like you're saying, with everything. But the, the idea with social, like I always preach, like with social media, is, it's awesome. But we can't yep. rely on it. Like we use it as an outlet, as a platform to promote yourself, especially now with Facebook Live and Instagram Live and everything else. It's like it's killer, yeah. you know, to bring people into your shop and see what the fuck you're doing, or offer your customers yeah. a chance to watch you live, make their peace for them, etc. But like, mm -hmm. you know, emails are still so important, and people don't really grasp how powerful your email is. You know, it's you know, not everybody wants to give out your email address, but it's like it's so important to have right. that that connection because, like you're saying, some people like snail mail, some people like you know, their email still, and. You know, it's it's yeah. so important, and and then like with the, the the social media, a lot of things I've been hearing a lot lately, just in the business space. Um, I can't think of the guy's name, but he wrote a book called "Your uh, Thousand True Fans," and this, okay. you know, it's the idea. It's like it doesn't matter if you have a hundred thousand fucking Instagram followers, if you have a thousand people on your Instagram that are like it's totally into your shit, and if yeah. uh, all all thousand of those people will spend at least a hundred dollars. Each individually a year, that's seven figures you can make in a year with your thousand people just offering something that everyone's gonna spend a hundred bucks. You know? Exactly. Yeah, so let's dive into that a little bit because Instagram and social media is is really fascinating to me. Okay. So when I first got back on the torch again last June or July, I knew that I had to have a social media presence. Um, and I was rec you know, my, my peers and my coworkers said, Chris, you should probably hop on Instagram, okay? So I did. And I had no followers, but I'm coming on Instagram with this certain skill set, with this ability, and it was my goal to share my comeback on Instagram. So you look at my very first post, it's a stupid marble, and then it's a reversal. And, and I've used Instagram to kind of show my growth, and, and people really, if you look at it, you'll have a very clear vision of where I'm heading. Mm -hmm. But to, to your point about, about the thousand true fans, okay, that is so true. It is incredibly true. Now, what happens with Instagram many times? Of course, there's the mailman here. <laughs> of course, the mailman is here. Hold on. We're going to say hi to the mailman, everybody on Torch Talk. <laughs> hi, I'm giving you an interview. I'll grab this from you real quick. Thanks, man. Cheers. Okay. Can you just set that on the table? Thanks, man. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. Oh, you're good, man. We, we can edit that out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, specific to Instagram. When you get on Instagram and you have this talent, when you have this ability, it's very tempting to want to buy followers, right? Because you, you, you might have talents, but you're talking to an empty room, right? So that doesn't exactly feel good. It's like when you open up a Twitter account or a Facebook account and guess what? You, you have no friends. Um, <laughs> that, that doesn't feel good. So I get the temptation to buy followers and you see it. You see it left and right. You see it it's rampant in this industry, okay? You can look at some of these glass blowers that pull, you know, they might be very average glass blowers, they might be okay, but they have 25,000, they have 50,000, they have 75,000 followers, and I'm scratching my head, I'm thinking, really? How, how exactly, uh, okay, maybe, maybe, no. You know, I, I couldn't really understand it when I first got back on Instagram, but, or when I first started on Instagram, but it became, increasingly clear that people are buying followers they're paying indonesian click farmers to give them likes and to give them comments in broken english and i'm scratching my head and i'm thinking why why is that and i get it i get the temptation to artificially inflate your follower count to to you know, just kind of stroke your ego a little bit and potentially give your brand a little bit more power for when people first visit your page. But I will suggest to anybody who has an Instagram account or is going to open one, don't do that. Don't go down that road. You, you don't need to. Um, and this is getting right to the heart of what you're saying about those thousand followers. I agree wholeheartedly because I fought tooth and nail for my first 100, my first 250, my first 500. When I got to 1,000, I thought, this is incredible, okay? And I used a variety of tactics to get there. But you are absolutely right that you don't need 25,000. You do not need 50,000 followers to help drive your business. I'm reaching, I'm going to be near 3K very soon that growth continues to 
increase almost exponentially. But within my follower base, those 2,700 or so people that are following me, these are enthusiastic people. Mm -hmm. These are people who love what I do. These are people who I interact with. And actually, some of these people I've become friends with. Um, it's special. It's, it's like it's organic. It's a way to build growth through sharing what you can do, interacting with people, and, and boom, you're going to find yourself you're going to find that it's it's pretty amazing what can happen. So, as if I haven't made this incredibly obvious already, don't buy followers. You don't need to. I get the temptation, right, when you first start. I totally get it. Yeah. But it does nothing for you in the long run. It it just doesn't. And then what? Every once in a while, Instagram comes through and wipes out these accounts, and you see your follower account cut in half. Yeah, exactly. That, that's not cool. That's like getting your pants pulled down in front of people. Yeah. And it's happened. It's <laughs> happened recently, right? I see it. And yeah. I see it locally, too, with people who are sitting at 16K one day, and the next day they're at 21,000 followers. And I'm just like, bullshit. Yeah. That is bullshit. Why? Why do you need to do that? Your work looks nice. You're heading in the right direction, but you see somebody else sitting with twenty thousand followers, so you've just you've got to get there. Yeah, exactly. I well, it's I, like it's like the whole concept of like making a piece of art, ex and you're already expecting likes and stuff, you know, for it and comments yep. before you even post the shit. It's like if you're making art for that kind of shit, you're wasting your fucking time. I I I agree. I, I agree wholeheartedly, um, and I guess it's kind of like. What what purpose do these people think Instagram will serve, right? Yeah, so yeah. if you already have a business and you're already okay, you just might want to bolster your following just to keep it in line with how you perceive your business to be. That's fine, right? A lot of it depends on how you define or how, how you view Instagram as a tool, right? For me, it is one of the arrows in my quiver that I use primarily to build my brand and to um, help um, – well, not only build brand and brand awareness, but it's definitely a driver of sales. It's not the only outlet for sales, and it can't be. And that gets back to what you talked about, how we can't – it's kind of dangerous to be too dependent on, on social media. Mm -hmm. I think um, I think in your conversation with Carl Termini, he mentioned uh, Facebook when Facebook kind of pulled the rug out from underneath him, and, and it was crickets. Yeah. Instantly, his business just went silent. Now, how scary is that, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't think he intentionally put all of his eggs in that basket. But when you're when you're dependent on social media, you got to remember you're you're still kind of at the whim of Mark Zuckerberg and you know whoever is running Facebook. Yeah, whoever's got the switch, the hand on the switch. Yeah, fucking a. Abso absolutely, and I, we I, I saw that. Very recently, Instagram and Facebook just throttled a bunch of accounts that were kind of these uh, social media kind of inspirational quote aggregate type accounts where they just kind of regurgitate content and mm -hmm. spit it out. But these are people that were dependent on their posts. They're able to advertise and they're able to you know make a, a, a really good life for themselves with these websites. And one day they go to their um, you know they open up their Facebook and guess what they can't log in yeah. or they can they can no longer pay to promote their their posts. So there's 7 million, there's 10 million followers that they've worked to actually build and engage. Now they can't reach them. Yeah. That's fucked up. So yeah, exactly. we can't, yeah, I mean, we can't let ourselves, we, we, we just can't let that happen. That would suck. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, go on. yeah, so go ahead. Tell I'll, me so more I, about I, what you're thinking. Well, I think the whole concept of social media, which I love for me is community and, and interacting with, you know, followers and friends and stuff. And, you know, for me, I, I, I take advantage of it in a sense where I use it for an online catalog at times or I just like to mm -hmm. share what's going on behind the scenes of my life, you know. You know, what I'm doing over at the mouse house or what my dogs are doing or my kids are doing or what I'm cooking. You know, I try to use it for more of like this is the lifestyle I'm living because of what I do for a living. I'm able to do this kind of stuff, not to brag and boast and show off, but I'm also yep. going to show like the shitty sides of life. Like I'm not going to be like, yes. you know, polishing a turd and saying, Hey, everything's fucking great all the time. <laughs> you know, it's because you know, you always see that you always see like the person who posts a picture and it's like the 10th take that they've had of their shot that's been filtered out. And it's like the best fucking angle they have, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. You know, just to, sh just to polish that turd to make it look like their life's, you know, shiny and awesome. And it's really that their life is fucking miserable and everybody sees that shit. And they think, Oh, this person's got a great life. And then they want to live up to that person. And really, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. It's fucking silly. You know, it is. And it, it's problematic too. If you're an artist and if you're someone who, you know, is looking to, 
to grow as an artist. So let's say you, you're a glass blower and you're kind of on the front end of your of your career and you're learning new techs. In, in, in this 24-7 Instagram, Facebook age, you're going to be exposed to so much work, okay? Mm-hmm. And like you said, it's always the perfect angle. It's the perfect lighting. There's photo editing involved. And you're going to see people that are going to continually blow you out of the water. So there's times when I'll look at my Instagram feed and I'll just be like, holy shit, look what that guy did. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'll be motivated by that. Or there's other times where I'll be like, fuck, I could never do that. Or can I? Um, maybe I can't. And it, so to your point, it's social media can beat you up as much as it can um, lift you up. And you need to be careful and you need to find that balance yeah. um, and, and, and see what works for you understand that much of what you see on social media is someone's highlight reel and you spoke very <laughs> you know you hit the nail on the head it's it, it it's a highlight reel it's not exactly real it's not it's not real life um but you can make very meaningful connections you can actually begin to monetize your work and your brand using social media and you can turn that into dollars so we don't want to like underestimate the power of it but you definitely have to um (laughs) look at it with a different set of eyes sometimes and and see the bullshit see the marketing see the models see the cars that they've rented i mean some of these people are incredible at branding themselves but you have to see it for what it is i mean it's like yep those are a couple of paid models you know Mm -hmm. um yeah (laughs) that bentley well, I don't know. I guess there are people in our industry that own Bentleys. I won't even say his name. But, I mean, you've got to realize, like, this guy with 10K with the Sherlock in his Bentley is probably smoking mirrors. I mean. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, go rent the ride for the weekend in Vegas or some <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's yeah. hilarious. Some of it's so fun. But there are people who have used Instagram um very effectively to to market themselves and i have to say i'm motivated by them yeah and i'm going to speak specific to to one guy right now who i've just loved his his presence in the last few months and that's kaj Beck, you know the millie guy out in california kaj has done such an amazing amazing job at at marketing himself and using sticker campaigns to reach out to people and creating this whole this whole wonka farm mystique it's amazing it's hilarious Now, his work is incredible. Yeah. It is so awesome. But look at what he's done in terms of advertising and marketing himself to build that brand awareness. That's fucking sexy to me. That's impressive. And that's what's helping to separate him from other people that might have that same skill set, might be equally good or better than yeah, him. Yeah, I agree. But but he's just doing such a good job. So it's fun. It's so fun to see these people that are, are creative online and that are... Um, you know, letting the world know who, who they are. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah. There's somebody else. I can't, I'm I'm having a brain fart. I'm I'm so terrible at names, but I say, I think it's like once a day he'll post himself. He has like this pimp character that he does. (laughs) And it's the funniest fucking thing, dude. He's like, there was something one day where he had like an apple on his table and he like went to go pick up the apple and he, like the, they just basically had it cut in half and hollowed out. So like inside of it was like some Oreo cookies or some shit like that. Like, <laughs> but it, he has like this whole demeanor about him the way he talks. It's like I, can, I I have to find what he is, what his thing is. It sucks because I'm always commenting on his page too. But it's like just every day he's got this like persona, this character that he does, and it's it's fucking awesome the way someone's taking advantage of social media. It's like I hear a lot of people using it with Snapchat and they're making these little small short films using Snapchat, and it's genius to do that you know it's like there's just so many different ways i don't have the fucking time to do it all myself and i'm probably like one of the worst with social media because i like i want to post every day but that i can but i you know it ain't gonna always gonna happen right i mean it it, it, it's it's hard but you you do see these people using it successfully and the people that make instagram fun i love it there's a guy goliath a lot of people know about goliath he is out there pushing the limits and he's it's it's comedy it's so funny to see some of those posts i kind of do the same thing with kind of just being a wise ass sometimes um you talked about instagram live you know that's something i was kind of apprehensive about doing initially because i I almost felt like it had this air of maybe being a little egotistical right i'm like who wants to see me work who really gives a shit about me (laughs) well I went live and then I went live again 
and you realize, holy cow, I have five viewers, now I have 40 viewers, now I have 80 viewers, and these are people who are actually tuned in, engaged, they are fish on the hook, and, and, and I don't mean to speak of them in terms that are that simple, but you think of it from a business perspective. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. These are people who are engaged. These are people who now, after seeing you one time or two times, will send you messages. You, your inbox will fill up, whether it's your email or your DMs, and they'll say, Chris, when are you going live again? Because me and my buddies, we want to watch you. Can you go live at 8 p.m. You know, Pacific time? And you're thinking, oh, my gosh. <laughs> now I'm kind of beholden to this audience a little bit. We're kind of we're gaining some traction. And so, like, specific to me and my brand, we developed this stupid program called Sun Sea After Dark. So once the sun sets, you know, it's time nice. to Sun Sea After Dark. And we'll, we'll have a vodka tonic, and we talk about stupid stuff, and we'll, we'll work through a certain glass technique. But more than that, it's, it's just being present. It's being present for your followers. And, it's, again, it's building that – that brand awareness and, and building those relationships that is fucking invaluable that yeah. is so amazing so rather than like just going live and not interacting with people and just working your way through some tech figure out a way that you can engage them figure out a way that you can be part of the conversation it's not always easy especially if you're you know you're trying to build something kind of complex <laughs> for example i'm in this fucking this this tournament this thing called the tournament of fire which was this instagram based tournament featuring 16 different glass blowers around the country and we're all going head to head in each round right so round one was the pinchy battle round two is the spoon battle round three was the sherlock battle and then the final round was the bubbler battle so i was lucky enough to make it to the final round um a large part of that was because of my followers because that 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 relatively small group of people those 2600 people i had at the time they were engaged they loved my work i mean i'm a I'm blown away. They voted for me. They kicked the shit out of every other person that I went up against. And there were times that my work, I'm like, ooh, I don't know if we're going to make it through this round. Jeez, I don't know. But my followers came out hard for me, and they they got me to the final round. So anyways, I'm That's live awesome. on Instagram. Yeah, I'm live on Instagram. I'm doing this pretty complex double bubbler build. You know, this thing is 13, 14 inches tall. It's big. There's plumbing. There's a million sections. And, and I'm live. And and I'm still trying to interact. And I'm doing this kind of hard weld, like the toughest weld when I'm putting the mouthpiece onto the, the main cans. And, and the haters appear, and they're going, tink, tink. Like, oh, is that a crack I heard? And it was, it was just funny it was so funny like um <laughs> i guess i'm trying to think what my larger point was for that but instagram live is is an incredible tool and when you can make yourself present and you can share things with people they will respond especially if you're a fucking jackass like me especially if you like to have fun mm -hmm. especially if you're not afraid to shoot the shit so yeah it's cool rather than just working through some tech hey let's have some fun with it i made i made a sandwich the other day live on instagram it was amazing we spent 30 minutes making a sandwich um and and um, i mean there's 40 50 people watching me put fucking mayonnaise on a piece of bread <laughs> right <laughs> it, it, it's it, so it fucking blew, funny it, it blew my mind. Yeah. But these people were into it, and they loved it, and, and I guess it just serves to you know, fuel the whole machine and keep, keep me on the trajectory that I want to be on. Um, so, yeah, social media, is, it, it's fun. More than anything, it's fun. But like you said, it takes an incredible amount of time and energy. Um, and if you're thoughtful, if you're purposeful in your movements on social media, I think you'll be amazed at the amount of traction you can get. Um, a lot of what I do is premeditated. There, there's mm -hmm. a method. There's a method to my madness. As much as I want to appear funny and to be silly, and I have this whole thing with donuts, which has now become kind of synonymous with my brand. Um, it's unreal. People send me donuts. People. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> it's just so weird. But when you're able to make those connections with people and get in their head. Um, Maybe they're going to be at the donut shop and they're going to see a chocolate glazed donut and they're going to think Sunsea Glass. They're going to think of fucking Chris in Minnesota. And, and you make these connections and that really serves to bolster your brand. Yeah, so, it's killer. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, yeah, just a real quick thing. I just I just tagged you in a couple things. I, um, the guy I was talking about, he goes by Mindful Glassworks. Oh, and, awesome. And uh, his character is Jimmy the Don. And the, the, <laughs> the video I was telling you about was actually it was him and it was an apple and he opens the apple up and he pulls pickle slices out of it. 
<laughs> it's the craziest shit. So I tag I'm you. writing that down right now. So yeah. I'm glad you tagged me, but I'm going to have to check out this guy and his pimp character. Yeah, oh, it's so good. That's, it's... that's amazing. I mean, <laughs> social media, Instagram, Facebook, it allows you this opportunity to create a character as well, too. Yeah. So some, some people might not want to take that risk, right? So if I'm out there and I'm kind of pushing the edge of what's appropriate, right? If I'm... It, you know, if I make a reference to to cannabis or the cannabis community, some people might say, "Chris, boom, you've gone too far." Okay, you you, you can't do that. Um, or if I if I have fun and if I kind of become more of a comedian, some people would say, "Chris, again, you've gone too far." You know, may, maybe you're turning people off at that point, and and that very well could be. But where I'm at on this journey is is I know where I want to go. And I'm willing to push some people away uh, while gaining a bigger following because that's true to who I am and that's true to what I want to do right now in this, you know, in this time on, on this planet, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, like, my family, so the in-laws or whoever, an aunt might say, Chris, boy, that Instagram, that's pretty inappropriate, you know, uh don't really like the language you're using on the old Instagram. and Or they might say, your work is incredible, but I don't really feel comfortable telling someone to go to Instagram to see your work because you're making functional glass, mm-hmm. because of the language you used on this live feed, because of this. And so I, I, I get that. I'm sensitive to that. And, and, and of course, I want to cast the biggest net possible to to gobble up as many customers as I can. But, and this is kind of a a truth that I live by, I'm willing to be myself and to take those risks and to kind of be that lovable jackass, even if it costs me a sale of a candy dish that might go to a 60-year-old lady, or even if it costs me that Christmas tree ornament that I could make for aunt whomever, Right. right? Yep. It's okay. We can't we can't win them all. So as part of the like, creating my identity, th- there's going to be winners and losers in that. There's going to be people that are going to respond to you, and there's going to be people that are going to be kind of put off. Um, <laughs> Goliath, amazing. The guy had me rolling. He was driving around town. Again, this is a little inappropriate. He's got a dildo stuck to the hood of his car. And he's <laughs> just weaving in the lane, and this dildo is sloshing back and forth. That's, That's hilarious. That is fucking awesome to me. I think that's great. Some people would cringe and say, oh, my God, I'm never going to go near that. Mm -hmm. To me, I'm like, dude, fuck, we're kindred spirits. I want to give Goliath a hug the next time I see him because that is fucking funny to me. Yeah, yeah. But again, with his approach to his social media campaign, there are going to be winners and losers. There's going to be people that aren't going to be receptive, and there's going to be people that are going to be energized and mobilized. Yeah, totally. Yeah, well, That's it kind of reminds. How it is. It, well, like right now, I'm I'm something I've been trying to get going for a bit was like to do like a, a just because I've, I've for the, like the last couple of years I've just been inundated with between work and and also taking in custom orders, which I'm not taking any orders right now, custom wise. So okay. I can, so I can focus on this a theme. I've always wanted to do like <clears throat> a series of something like that. You know, a lot of these guys that are out there and gals that are doing shows nowadays or doing solo shows. It's inspired me to want to do my own solo show. Yeah, kind of thing. So, I've, but I've always wanted to do something that was very provocative and would turn a lot of people off, in a sense. Okay. But also, like the people that I my that like you're saying, like the, those that I speak to my community, it would turn them on yep. and they'd be all excited about it. You know, kind of concept. And yeah. uh, so, it's, and and the, the I'm not going to tell anybody. Like the, the name of the 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 theme is called testing the waters, and it's also mm-hmm. kind of like goes along with where I am right now in my life and and what have you. Um, yeah, absolutely. But but what I'm going to be launching, like what's what I'm creating right now, is like it's whimsical and slapstick and slightly offensive and sli- <laughs> slightly erotic and like all at nice. the same time, you know, kind of thing. <clears throat> like I'm super excited about it, but it's like it's going to offend a bunch of people potentially, and it, <laughs> it but it, then it may not. I don't really know, but I'm going to take this big risk yes. and create a whole series that hopefully by this time next year I'll have a nice collaboration of work I can put together and then have a show somewhere, you know, as a, as a solo artist. I, I, I think that's awesome. I think that's so awesome, especially if you label yourself, you know, as, as a glass artist. I think it's important to take those risks. And inevitably you're going to offend some people, but <laughs> that's art. Mm-hmm. <Yeah. laughs> it's, it's just so uh, Why Why play it safe? 
and again, I think too, it might be a function of your age and your maturity and your your willingness willingness to take those risks because you you're just being honest with yourself and and this is the direction I want to go and and you'll see the market will decide very quickly <laughs> whether they're on board with you or not. Yeah, exactly. So it's okay to take those risks <laughs> and if you if you if you have to you know make an adjustment. So be it. But I mean, yeah. I see all of these strange, provocative things on Instagram that are that seem to have quite the following, whether it's like a clip cap or mm -hmm. I mean, you know, all yeah. of these things that are very peculiar to me and very strange. Um, but there's an audience for that. So oh, whatever you choose. I hope you find success with it, and, and I'm there to support you and wave the flag. So. Yeah, dude, appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it's funny, though, man, because like, that's one of my things I've always enjoyed. Like when, when Z first came out with her vag pipes and her tubes, like yeah. I was like, man, what dude is making these things? Like I didn't even know it was a female making them at first because it was just it didn't seem like a female would make a pipe with a vag, you know, with a vag on there and a finger perk in the whole nine yards. I'm like, this is fucking amazing. And then I, I and then know. I found out who it was and I was just like, you know, it made me even happier that it was a female making it. Not to mention her background and her art, you know, ability and whatever she's doing. But then to see where she is now with her work and that kind of like was one of those things that opened up people's eyes to who who's this artist and that's what it takes sometimes man it's just a little controversy that then gets people talking Definitely. about you and then next thing you know you're making seven figures a year because you can't keep enough glass in your studio to fucking <laughs> you know keep keep it going it's it's crazy absolutely yeah that that's that's so awesome and it's 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 been wonderful to see glass artists that are able to create their own identity and you know there's a dragon guy and then there's a rhinoceros guy and there's a hippo guy and oh the hippo guy is not a rhinoceros guy because he's a hippo guy right and there's a there's a goblin guy and it's just been wonderful for me to see people that have taken um certain attributes or certain themes and and made it their own i will say there are some people that are treading in dangerous waters in in terms of their their parody or them potentially being in direct violation of copyright mm -hmm. law because there's so many people taking liberties with other people's content. Um, and again, I'm not going to speak specific to anybody, but you see it. You see these concepts that are, that, you know, it's property that doesn't belong to them. And you see these people selling pieces that yeah. are blatant ripoffs. And I wonder, I wonder how this is all going to shake out because we've seen recently, we've seen some lawsuits where where people in this industry have uh yeah they've taken some punches they've yeah. had to pay they've, they've paid some fines and 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 really rightly so i guess again without throwing anybody under the bus specifically right but you know have, unfortunately there's the one company that's put their middle finger up to the other company and then it to me it sets a bad precedence for other artists to be like yeah i'll do the same thing but when you're like a little small guy and you're getting right. sued for several hundred thousand dollars that you're like, oh my right. God, what am I going to fucking do? You know, it's like, it, it, you know, it's, exact, it sucks. Exactly. It's a That's bad example. Tough. So, yeah. So if I'm, if I'm an artist and I want to use a piece of cane from a famous like Millie maker and it has a small image on it, I'm comfortable to do so. Okay. I mm -hmm. think that's okay. If I want to make like this, sim use this silly Simpsons knockoff Millie, I might be in violation. I might not. It might be safe under you know parody law I, I'll put that on my piece but if I'm going to blatantly steal let's say Breaking Bad and I'm going to do some Heisenberg filicellos and I'm going to just blatantly take that concept and incorporate that into a body of work and begin to sell it inevitably it's going to be successful right mm -hmm. you're taking someone else's idea you're monetizing it and then you're starting to make shitloads of money I think that company has every right to come at you and to well, hopefully encourage you to go in a different direction. I just see that as being fair. Um, we talked a little bit about business, okay? There are ways that you can reach out to these people and say, hey, here's who I am. Here's what I'm thinking of doing. Why don't we work together on this? And I think, like, if I was a Millie guy, right, I would do most of my work right now building relationships with these big companies so that I have ownership of that content, right? So if I'm a Millie maker and I want Disney, I want Disney themes and Disney concepts, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to meet every damn executive that I can. I'm going to let them know what I make, what my plans are, and I'm going to try to license those images and I'm going to try to incorporate that into my work legally. Now, I'm assuming some people are doing that already. Maybe people aren't. 
but why not? Why not partner up rather than just blatantly steal, right? Yeah, exactly, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I don't know. It's just that that's more appealing to me. And again, it's kind of sexy because it's business. It's business. You can get in there and you can you can make things happen. And then guess what? So and so, the Millie Maker is now in house. Disney, whatever, and guess yeah. what? You're the Mickey Mouse guy. Yeah, exactly. And they're gonna buy all the fucking Mickey Mouse came from you. That's pretty special. And those relationships can happen. You can fucking make that happen. So why not do it versus making some dabachinos and getting sued? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's interesting too, man. Like having when I had Luke Zimmerman on, we got into that whole talk about the copyright trademarks ideas and and even getting into like the Joe Camel talk with this, with Camel and the cigarettes and stuff and like yep. you know, their whole idea of like marketing for kids and he's like, you know, really it's it's hard to say but Watch out making things that are cutesy or whatever because it's going to something right. that could potentially go for towards the kids. And it's it's a reality. You know, I mean, there's there's so many areas as legalization happens in this community. Continue, I mean, we're all in like in, yes. we're still like in the teenage, you know, we're not quite teens. Maybe we're like in the tween phase right now, you know, sure. but you know, there's going to be a point to where we're going to be dealing with liability issues just based on the fact that someone burns herself on a fucking nail that we made or a yeah. rig we made that yes. they can sue us for it. You know, it's. You know, exactly. we got to really cover our asses. And there's a lot of these things. I mean, even those of us that have been doing this for fucking a, over a decade don't think about. But it's just the reality of what things are going to be leading towards. For sure. For sure. And it's hard, right? Those aren't those aren't pleasant conversations to have <laughs> when you think about what you're making and how that opens yourself up to liability. That th those aren't fun things to think about, yeah. you know, getting fucked in the ass by someone because of uh, either a political witch hunt or, or some litigious lawyer just out there looking to, you know, shake a tree and see what falls down. I mean, the bigger you get. Mm, you know, the the more the likelihood of, that, of something like that happening increases, right? So if you're just a hobbyist at home, yeah, maybe you're okay to, to not have that, that concern. But if you're an individual who's looking to build a brand, build a product line, make yourself present, be in those shops and sell units by the hundreds, by the thousands, you have to realize, yeah, you're opening yourself up to a whole host of liabilities. Um, just like you said. And the fact that we kind of operate under this umbrella, this kind of cannabis community umbrella, right? At least insofar as the functional art glass mm -hmm. industry operates, right? Let's be honest. Cannabis dollars are fueling this industry, yeah. right? <laughs> the time. explosive growth. Some people may not come out and say that, but for me, at least my opinion, this whole borosilicate bubble, these hyperinflated prices, are fueled by the cannabis industry, right? Yeah. Yep. And 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 that, and that's okay, but because we operate in this realm, again, it's a liability. Okay, I live in Minnesota. All we have here is medical marijuana, but it's incredibly restrictive, and the patient pool is very limited. And there's no flower. There is absolutely no recreational marijuana allowed here. You are in violation of it if you make paraphernalia, both locally and federally. So our products are tobacco pipes, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Okay, well, get this. I, I'm i aligning myself with the cannabis community nationally, right, by being present on Instagram, by shipping my products, potentially, this is in quotes, potentially to any federal government official who's listening, should I ship my product to Colorado or to California where recreational marijuana is legal? Well, guess what? Now I'm in violation of federal law, potentially some local law as well. And it's just such, uh, it's the waters are so incredibly muddy. There is no uniformity in law, both state and locally. And it's just this hodgepodge of shit. So <laughs> yeah. I, I wish there was a way, I wish there were, I wish there was a level playing field. I wish there were rules in place so people like me could take full advantage, right? You kind of got to know how to play the fucking game before you get on the field, right? Yeah, oh yeah, big time, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and so we don't have that now, and that's, it's just so problematic. So let's revisit back in 2003, Operation Headhunter, Operation Pipe Dreams. We had a conservative administration in place. We had an attorney general, John Ashcroft, who was anti-cannabis. And on a political whim, the government went and spent, you know, uh, eight figures, what, $12 million or more to 
go on this little witch hunt. And they decided that it was in the best interest of the country to go and um, imprison people, to steal their assets, to shut down their studios, because what they made was deemed to be drug paraphernalia, and it was deemed to be in violation of federal law. That's craziness. That's crap. And we can look back at that, and we can see we can see what a failure it was, right? It's yeah. just kind of this yeah. last gasp at, at, at pfft, whatever, trying to squash a bug, a bug that doesn't even need to be squashed, right? Looking at it in hindsight, it's almost comical how absurd that operation was. But at the time, it was very real. And that was yeah. one of the things that motivated me to shut down a website, a website that I had called createapipe.com, a website that was successful. It was another reason, it was a motivating factor and one of the reasons why I left the industry entirely because I saw people's livelihoods being taken from them. I saw everything they worked for, their equipment, their lathes, their production shops being seized pursuant to civil forfeiture. Their bank accounts were frozen. And these are real human beings, right, with families. And this is a job to them. They're not they're not criminals. <laughs> they're just making functional glass art, right? So that was scary. That was very real. Um, and really, again, looking back, it was just simply unbelievable. But okay, let's talk about the present. Let's look at where we are now. Under federal law, right, it's still a violation of it if you make what's deemed drug paraphernalia and you transport it across state lines. We have a new president who is is a maniac. <laughs> we don't know what the hell he's going to do. But we can look to who he appointed as his attorney general and think, hmm, this could get kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I can't prognosticate. I can't tell what the fucking future is going to bring. But holy shit, let's not go down that road again, okay? So my biggest point here is, oh my gosh, can we have some sensible reform in terms of cannabis law federally? I mean, not even speaking of my little state, Minnesota, which I love. I mean, we're so liberal and we're so smart and it's such a great state, but we just have these boneheads that continue to keep us in the dark ages. And it's, it's problematic. So Minnesota, come on, let's do something. But larger, <laughs> larger than that federal law, I mean, it's time. It's really time. The time has come. Let's be smart about this and let's kind of make some sensible changes to cannabis law that can directly affect us. That would free us up of so many liabilities um, and it would just it would just make sense. Yeah, for um, sure. Well, the problem, though, is that that, um, that I'm hearing and that's what's, you know, because it's state to state and things are just every state has their own ways of going about it because it's such a new thing. They're all evolving and trying to find the best ways to make it happen. But right. like the pipe laws aren't changing. So what we have to have is some kind of person that's involved with the cannabis community, you know, that's going to yeah. be able to be there to help get the vo the word out there as these laws change that the pipe laws need to change too. Because like, for instance, in Washington, D.C., like they've got recreational or not, rec you know, or, or medicinal shit, but, but they yep. can't sell pipes. I know that uh, D.C. specifically is the fucking Wild West. It is so interesting that they've chosen, to de they've chosen to decriminalize, you know, uh, possession of cannabis as well as the cultivation of it up to whatever their silly limits are, right? Whatever arbitrary number they chose. But they didn't develop any infrastructure, any mechanism to sell it, to regulate the commerce or to do anything. In fact, if, I, if I'm correct on this, you can't, you can't sell it, but you can give it away. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what do you find? You find people on Craigslist selling, not selling cannabis, but what they're doing is they're going to deliver you a small amount of cannabis for $50 delivery fee. Yeah. <laughs> or you, you see people popping up with folding tables <clears throat> sitting outside of a, a pizza joint, and, and, and you can get yourself, uh, you can buy yourself a very expensive T-shirt and you're going to get some cannabis with it. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> it, it, it's, that being said, like years ago here in Florida, um, they were trying to pass what was going to be called the bong law or a bong tax, okay. right? So for the smoke shops to to be able to sell, to be able to be a smoke shop, they were having it set up to where 75% of your annual revenue had to be from tobacco sales. So they okay. were going to have it set up to where like if you sell a pipe, you pay a tax on that pipe. It can only be a, you know twenty five percent of your revenue, but the taxes that you pay are going to be going towards what's considered the quote unquote bong tax. So because you're paying a bong tax, because bongs the term is federally illegal, you're now yeah. saying that you're federally breaking the law by paying this tax. So what the shops are were thinking like, well, we'll just sell 
a pack of cigarettes and then we'll give you a free pipe or we'll sell a t-shirt for a hundred dollars and you get a free pipe. You know what I'm saying? And they were trying right. to find like ways of going about it. It got thrown out because it was unconstitutional and horse shit, but that was like some of, the, some of the backwoods bullshit. So for like almost a year and a half, they'll be yeah. around here wanting to buy any pipes because everybody's freaking out. Like what the fuck's going on? Yeah. yeah it's, it's crazy. I, I, again, again, no uniformity, no common sense, especially when it comes to any law, any regulation. Yeah. And we need that. We need that. And what, you know, with the whole advent of, of this medical cannabis industry, which I think is a wonderful thing. I mean, we could talk for an hour about how amazing medical cannabis is for people. Um, I've heard rumors of, you know, allowing pipes to be legal federally because they are used, you know, as an instrument to deliver medication. Mm -hmm. But what that does is it opens up pipes to being regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Yeah, exactly. um, you know, you, you're going to have other requirements more bureaucracy, more red tape. So we have to be kind of careful what we wish for. And again, getting back to what you said, we need an advocate. We need people on the front line waving the flag, so to speak, so that when these decisions are made, they're made by, at least in conjunction with people who know what the fuck is going on, mm -hmm. not some suit that is so separated from it who knows absolutely nothing about it. Because how stupid would it be for us to be like subject to FDA regulation, and then your shot needs to be inspected to make sure it's OSHA approved, and this and that, and next, you know, we've got just all this bureaucracy. Well, that's where it's going to head towards, though, dude. Like, I, I mean, in all reality, I think that that's where, once federal legalization happens, I think that the, yep. the pipe industry, which is why I'm doing this online course, because I'm trying to create something that's going to be uniform for everybody across the board, so that when the mm -hmm. shit does happen, when, when we are considered a trade, like an electrician or a plumber or whatever... Yep. That yep. you'll be able to have a certification that says, hey, I know this, 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 and this. I know how to set up my studio, my ventilation, the whole nine yards. So that when this yeah. shit happens, you're prepared, you're proactive about this stuff. Because it's going to happen. I mean, it's, the reality is, it may not be tomorrow, it might not be in 10 years, but it's going to happen. And we've right. got to be prepared for it. We've got to understand our rights and laws and understand how to properly set up a studio. Because, I mean, look at the guys that are manufacturing color now. They've had to spend millions of fucking dollars yes. to redo yeah. their whole manufacturing facilities to make sure that they have, like, zero emissions. And then you're talking about the FDA stuff. That was a real thing. Like, Luke Zimmerman, we, him and I were talking about it, and he wanted to come on okay. the show because he was going through the paperwork to see how that was going to affect our industry. Because, like you're saying, in the medical states, it's you're not selling a pipe for marijuana you're selling a, a, a tool to dispense exactly. medicine and there's so yep. many liabilities that are involved in that fortunately it didn't affect us but it did affect like the for instance like the vape shops that are selling you know liquid vape vape stuff yeah i have a whole different sure. opinion on that but you know that's a different situation <laughs> but you know it's it's just it's just interesting to where things are going to go and, and if those that don't take this seriously if you're not paying your taxes if you're not setting yourself up as yes. a whatever you don't need to be yeah. an llc but just be you know a l legit business Correct. You know, there's Correct. so many there's so many things like the last episode I just did, it was kind of a rant talking about it, but it was like are you a hobbyist or are you a business? And if you're a business, this is what the IRS's right. regulations are saying. You got to follow these guidelines in order to be considered a business. If you're not following these guidelines, then maybe you're just a hobby, but if you're not a hobby and you're a business, then you got to follow <laughs> these guidelines. It's like there's such a weird fucking dynamic that they want to throw out there and half of it's lawyer speak and you can't understand this shit. Again, exactly. why I preach to go get a fucking accountant that might cost you 100 bucks a month or less than that. <laughs> you know, it's like Yes. It's going to save you so yeah. much. Yes, uh, of of course. So muddy waters again. Um everything you're saying is is so true and I I think it would be it really benefit the industry as a whole to kind of have this brain trust, this group of people who could potentially come together and really kind of keep people current because so much of this industry is I won't say driven by, but it responds to the rumor mill, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And 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 we need to know what is truth and what is just a rumor. And boy, it would be nice to know what direction we're going in. Um, and, and specific to what you talk about in terms of FDA regulations, I do think potentially that could be okay. Because holy shit, you see some of these people's shops that they're working in. Yeah. I don't even worry about the product they're making as much as I worry about the craftsmen, the artists themselves mm. living till they're 30 yeah. or 40, whether they're going to blow their fucking eyeballs out due to improper eyewear, whether their lungs are filling up with nanoparticles of copper <laughs> yeah. because they're like, shit, why not fume with copper? 
I'm like, holy crap, dude, you have a fan in the window. How about you don't burn copper? Because yeah. <laughs> do you want to ingest a neurotoxin? Are you looking forward to an Alzheimer's type pathology when you're 35? Like, oh my God. <laughs> like, That's why I started the show, dude, because of that same shit. Like I, you're saying, I remember seeing kids on Instagram with box fans in their, in their bedrooms <laughs> with carpet floors right next to their fucking bed. Yes. Like, I've, you know, I've been there, done that. Don't yes. get me wrong. I had a I had a nice <laughs> ventilation set up in my bedroom, but that's a whole other situation, <laughs> you know. But still, it's right. like it's why I started this show. I'm like, fuck, I got to reach out to these people. They're gonna kill themselves no, and their family or something in the process. Exactly, that's super smart. And so, uh, whether you're a hobbyist or you're a business owner, I mean, I see people that pass themselves off as legitimate business owners who could stand to educate themselves. Uh, a lot in terms of how to build a shop and how to set it up properly. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> let's not only ventilate the air, let's bring in some fresh air, how about, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and that standard AGW lens, that ain't going to do shit for you when you're saturating all that color with heat and you're doing all that fuming. I'd like to recommend a shade five for your employees so their eyeballs don't fucking burn out on them. Yeah. Um, you, you know, simple things that people... I, I, again, I just don't think they pay attention to it. They're not setting themselves up to be successful in the long run. Okay, so you know, as glass blowers, we have this trade where a, a lot of knowledge is is kind of handed down. There's a lot of old wives' tales, and again, there's not a lot of uniformity in terms of how to do things appropriately. You know, you can buy a book from what Mylon Townsend. You can buy. <laughs> you know, Bondu has some of these books, and they're awesome. The Mike uh, Oria, Oralens Mike has has wonderful information online uh, as far as ventilation primers and the right size fan to get and the number of air exchanges you should have within a certain volume of space for yep. certain types of work. I mean, the information is out there, but let's be honest: most most people, most hobbyists. They want to choose the path of least resistance. They want to get going. They want to fucking make a recycler, and they want it done now. And they don't give a shit about doing it the right way. Yeah. Um, about pulling points. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm so glad you're an ally <laughs> with me on the value of pulling a fucking point. Let's just be honest right now. Chris with Sunsea Glass is a point puller. It develops a tremendous amount of hand skill. It's an incredibly valuable tool, uh, and it's it, it's fundamental for your growth as a glass artist. So mm -hmm. let's be honest. Everybody, let's pull some fucking points. Yeah. But, um, yeah, put it on the list of other things people could do right. I love it, too, because now I'm going to have hate. The DMs are going to fill up. <laughs> Fuck you, bro. Check out, check, you know what I mean? Check out my prep, bro. Check out what I pulled off of this fucking 12-7 handle and this fucking 31-7 blank, bro. Can you do that? Yeah, I can probably do that. You know, blocked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's going to be fun. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Stay no, tuned. Good. I, yeah, exactly. Stay <laughs> tuned. I'll be I'll be sharing the highlights of it on my Instagram <laughs> um, because inevitably there will be some hate, and, and, and that's okay. But yep, yep, yep. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't get me in more trouble. <laughs> also, let's be clear here. The host is a point puller as well. Oh, yeah. I will just... Please direct all hate mail to Wise Guy Media. If I, had the email, if I had the email in front of me, I'd give it to you right now. You can find that information on the Wise Guy. Uh, It'll be in the show Instagram. notes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Give, it, give, the, give the hate to him, man. <laughs> I get nothing but love. Yeah, exactly. Well, rightly so. You're a good man. That's yeah. how it should be. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah. Yeah, buddy. Uh. That's fucking funny. So I kind of want to back up a little bit because we've gone all the place. Do it. Yeah, man. So, so when you first started off here, when at the very beginning of your of your humble beginnings, what kind of stuff yep. were you were you making like production wise? Cool. So I cut my teeth as a production glass blower. That was important to me. That was awesome. I saw tons of value in that because. You have to remember, I wanted to pay the bills, right? So I'm motivated by keeping my lights on and keeping food in my belly, more so than just like making one-off artistic pieces. Yeah. So production was my bread and butter. In fact, the very first things that I did was pull points for the shop. Again, this small shop of four or five people. I'd get my 25-4 heavy, my 31-7 heavy wall, and I would set about to pull, I don't know, 150, 200, 300 points in a day. And I remember the owner at the time was like, Chris, I'll give you $1 for every point you pull. Well, very quickly he realized I could pull a shitload of fucking perfect points. So the dollar went to 50 cents. And then the <laughs> sounds dollar like went to mine thing, dude. Cents. Totally. I know. I'm sounds like, just like my you, shit. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't take that away from me, right? <laughs> I'm making a ton of money here, and I, I, isn't this what it's all about? But um, 
so after pulling points very quickly, you know, really with, within a matter of a week, it's it's marbles, it's it's implosion marbles, it's it's mushroom marbles, a dollar a piece, then fifty cents a piece, mm-hmm. then a quarter a piece, because you start kicking ass and people realize, holy shit, this this guy's kind of got it all figured out. Um, very quickly, I moved into pinchies, and and a lot of my work back then wasn't even surface work, although I did have some exposure to that. You know, your very classic wrap and rake, right? right. Yeah, yeah. That kind of old school soft glass technique that that transcended to the borosilicate world where it's just a very simple rack wrap and then and then a rake um we did some of that but mainly what we did back then was inside out work with gold and silver very classic fuming approaches and i still love that to this day mm-hmm. it's so it's so funny because it's almost like what's old is new again yeah and what I, what i mean by that is the the modern generation of customers a lot of these younger people now that are 18, 20, 22, they didn't have that exposure to fume work like we did back in the day. Like when we first started coming, becoming aware of the glass blowing community, fuming, fuming was dominant. Fuming was everywhere. There were all these West Coast artists that were so amazing at different fuming techniques, not even just dots. I'm talking reversals and foldovers and all this tech that was coming out of nowhere in the mid 90s that stuff was so impressive to me and and again it's just kind of funny now to see that what's old is new it's back you know there's guys like lammy um out of portland he calls it smoke tech right well it's a basic fold over technique that's been around for over 20 years mm-hmm. um it's great and again not to slight lammy at all but it's just amazing it what's old is new yeah but to get back to what i made you know I was a production glass blower. I made inside out spoons. I made inside out pinchies. I made bubblers. I made stuff specific to retail stores. I was very much beholden to what they wanted. And I was happy to make that because I know I got paid. <laughs> and it was like, yep. it was important to make money. We, ha- I mean, it was so important. I, I wasn't sitting on this pile of dirty money. I didn't have, I'm not wealthy. I very much viewed this as a job, and it was so awesome to be able to sit and to be artistic and to use a technique and to make a functional piece of glass and have it sell and to get paid for it. That was so motivating. So I'm a production glass blower at heart. That's who I am, and I want to encourage any young buck or any person out there who struggles with direction, who struggles wondering what can I make? How can I make money at this trade? You need to you need to find your niche, and that niche can include production glass blowing. There is no shame in being a guy who sits down and makes 10, 20, 30 spoons in a day. Yeah, because exactly. Because you can turn that into money. Yep. And like you and I talked about with pulling points, production glass blowing is it pays so many dividends. It develops a tremendous amount of hand skill for you. Okay, it it teaches you how to develop a product and replicate it, and a lot goes into that. People don't understand, but it's like let's say you have this design of a spoon that's successful. Great, replicate it, not in double or triplicate. Replicate it times a thousand. Yep. Okay, and a lot goes into that too because now you have to buy supplies. Now you have to buy more tubing, and you kind of set forth. Uh, creating this infrastructure, this means of, of, of producing this product and keeping that production line going. So there's so much value there. And I think people, I think that's lost on some people, you know, who, who are new to this industry. They want to hop in and they want to make that recycler. They want to make that client. They want to make this product. And they have absolutely no desire to do production glass blowing. You know, they think, oh, fuck, I can pull off this clear recycler. Boom, I get a thousand bucks. <laughs> good luck. Mm-hmm. It really, if you can do that, awesome. Really good. I mean, great. I, I'm not trying to say it can't be done. But <laughs> I, I think more often than not, that that's kind of a tough approach, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, Mike, my, my whole my whole perspective is to learn the medium so you can make whatever the fuck you got to make. Because if one day we all get shut down, I mean, don't get me <laughs> wrong, a lot of us will go underground like I did you know, back then. But right. the reality is, it's like learn your medium. Like my brother's been encouraging me to get to focus more on my solid sculpture work because he's, he, I mean, he loves what I do as a as a functional artist. But like, 
Oh, that's great. He's all about like motivating me to continue focusing on my solid work because he finds like my solid sculptural stuff is like a thousand times better. Like he's blown away, but I'm what I'm doing with my solid work, and yes. you know, which is encouraging to to motivate myself to do that even more. So, but I've learned all that shit that I've got now because I did production spoons. Absolutely, I mean it's it's invaluable. I mean, yeah, it's you huge. cut your teeth on production, you develop those hand skills, and you develop a, a, a ton of business acumen as well. So. But it's ego, right? Doesn't ego get in the way of some of our better decision making in life? Yeah. You know, we, well, want, yeah. we want it, and we yeah. want it now. And it's also the encouragement of friends that don't ha- don't. I mean, I can't say they don't have an opinion because they do. But like, you know, you'll yep. see somebody new that posts up something that's like total newbie, something yep. that you know probably doesn't have a good weld or something like that, and their friends <laughs> are like, oh yeah. my god, that's the fucking almost awesome thing I've ever seen. And the next thing you know, it's going on auction, and the kid's getting like ten grand for it. I mean, it's not getting that much, oh, yeah. but but you know, it's it still sets this fucking thing that's like, it's a complete false sense of reality and accomplishment exactly. that just you know. And then when yep. they don't go right, then it's like, what the fuck? Why is why isn't this continuing to happen? I like for myself personally, I think the worst thing I can do is run an auction and get like yeah. half of what I wanted for the auction, and then start <laughs> going through other auctions and seeing guys selling and auctioning off like a pennant for like four hundred bucks. You I know. know it's like the most discouraging <laughs> shit ever. And I'm always like, what the fuck? What's 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 the difference between them and me? I mean, what the fuck? But if you do that, it's just going to discourage you, and it, ma- it makes your shit worse. Ab- absolutely, that's. That's not setting yourself up for a good mental health day. No. <laughs> I, I play those games, too, where I'll, I'll pay attention to some people's auctions, and I'm just blown away by, again, I don't want to say names, because cheers to them for building a brand and an enthusiastic base. But when you're making a basic pendant, you're getting $8,000, $10,000 for something that I know took you maybe an hour to make, mm-hmm. maybe two. I think that's... It's incredible. It's kind of a double-edged sword, right? I respect it. I'm like, wow, good for you. But then the other part of me is like, really? Like, that's kind of crazy. Um, do we deserve to get paid that much? I, again, it's kind of an ethics thing, and it's yeah. its its own conversation. Again, we kind of hinted at this borrow bubble and what could potentially be fueling the market and fueling these prices. And mm-hmm. So I don't know. I kind of remain on the fence with that but <laughs> yeah it's it, it's really interesting and getting back to what you're saying these kids these kids coming up and these people they might not be kids they might be any age but you need to diversify you need to understand the medium and all of its different uh capacities like you talked about hollow and functional and sculptural approaches all of these things are so important, especially if we have a shift or a change in the industry, which could happen any time, mm-hmm. let's be honest. Yeah. We never know. So yeah, learn your medium, learn it. In fact, when I got back, right, we talked about how I was a production glass blower, did a ton of proto, then I left for 10 years, and I came back. I saw how the industry had changed. We had gone from largely flower pieces <laughs> where the innovation back then would have been a wet piece, right? You've yeah. got bubblers and we've got, you know, diff- different types of tubes and things. And then now we've gone to kind of more of an oil-based uh, production model. It seems like, you know, these mini tubes and these banger hangers dominate the market. In fact, flower pieces are increasingly going the way of the dinosaur. Yeah. You know, there, there's still going to be that market, okay, but it's almost more of a nostalgia market, and let's be honest, it's 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 kind of uh, waning. It's, it, it's going away. But my biggest point here is that when I got back, I didn't have the skill set to make this stuff, okay? I've done drop stems, and I had done ring seals before, but on a different scale and on a different level. So when I started doing some of these more complicated assemblies that involved plumbing and these really these these penetrations, these ring seals that are very violent to the glass, right? We are thoroughly pissing it off <laughs> when we hit it with a single jet, rip through five mil wall thickness, and then we slap a down stem in there. The glass gets pissed off. So inevitably, some of my first rigs cracked, right? And it pissed me off. I'd get done with the piece, it would be in the kiln, and this is a beautiful piece of glass, $1,000 smoke all day, and I'd hear that inevitable tink, yeah. and I'm like, fuck me, fuck, damn it, why, what is going on? So what did I do? I educated myself. I reached out to the scientific glass blowing community. I deferred to the experts. 
I humbled myself. I said, you know what, Chris, you're failing. You're fucking failing hard right now. Let's not do this anymore. So I reached out to some scientific glass blowers. One guy, Giovanni Astro Glass, outside of Chicago. Gio was so nice, and he spent time with me, and he taught me about. He taught me more about stress than I ever knew was possible. He taught me about polariscopes. He taught me about Bunsen burners. He taught me about annealing flames. He taught me about different kiln temperatures and different all these different temperature dynamics that are in play when you do some of those complex assemblies. And I am so much stronger and so much better having humbled myself <laughs> and spent the time to seek out that education. Yeah, it's important. But it is. And so I'd encourage everybody else to do that too. If you fail, who cares? It's okay. You're going to fail. I fail. I'll probably fail later today. But <laughs> use that as fuel. Use it as fuel to get better. Don't don't just play to your strengths, right? And this is kind of more of a general philosophy. What good is that if you're just a one-trick pony who plays to his strengths? How about you work towards your weaknesses and get better every day, get better, add more to your tool belt, another arrow in the quiver. That's my metaphor. That's what's fucking sexy to me. That's what drives me to continue to get better. Focus on your weaknesses and just get out there and kick ass. Yeah. Everybody can do that. The knowledge is there. People like you providing this service, this podcast, the knowledge is there. I mean, there's generations of scientific glass blowers. Believe it or not, some of them are on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Reach out to them. Pick their brain. These are the guys that sat down and did the ring seals for Toro. These are the guys that can do violent penetrations and ring seals and all this complex plumbing, and they can fucking bench cool their stuff. Yeah, exactly. And put it in, and put it in the kiln at the end of the day. That's what I want to know how to do. And guess what? That's what I can do now because I took the time to learn that stuff. So, yeah, that's amazing. You know, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I meant to bring you back on, man, to uh, yep. to cover that because uh, for myself personally, that's still stuff I'm learning. Like, you know, mostly being self-taught and not having really taken any classes. I'm, you know, yep. went through the first part of my life of glass blowing with like seven, eight colors, and now all of a sudden, yes. we've got this whole huge palette. And I got away with so much shit because we were, we were limited to colors. <laughs> and now yes. I got, I'm, I'm learning as I go. Like my brother's really big on top of this stuff, and he's like, "Yeah, you got to do this, this, and this." And I'm like, "Okay, cool. I'm glad I know that now." You know, because like flame <laughs> properties, certain torches, you know, blah, blah, yes. blah. There's so much involved now with what's going on. Exactly. So many variables in terms of the colors we're using and flame chemistries and different torches. Um, let's talk about color because color is so funny to me. Um, we both started in a similar time frame, you know, back in the late 90s. And, and it's so fun to look back at what we had to use back then because <laughs> we had yeah. ruby, we had dark orange, we had some kind of crazy exotics that were incredibly unstable. Mm -hmm. We had potentially a caramel or a silver strike. Basically, we had this very limited palette, and that's why we – that's why I, in my work, used a lot of fuming because it was color changing, right? It yeah, was exactly. Color changing glass, and that was so cool. <clears throat> different flame chemistries and different fuming techniques and combinations of gold and silver to get this gem-like quality out of your glass. I mean, it was so awesome. Yeah, man. <laughs> and then, and then we fast forward to today, where you have. <sighs> So many different color companies, whereas before we had, what, Alchemy and North Star dominated. Mm -hmm. um, now we have all these kind of little auxiliary, auxiliary boutique companies popping up. We've got a variety of import colors available to us. Um, it's absolutely bananas, um, the options that are available to us. And I, and I think that's so great. Um, uh, the hype colors, though, are so funny to me <laughs> because... Yeah. It, it's so weird. You never know. You never know what's going to be like the next hype color. And I wonder, I wonder what's really driving this hype color trend. Is it consumer demand or is it these color companies throwing it out there, kind of seeing what sticks and then the rest is history. Uh, I don't know, but the color that really comes to my mind and, and I'll probably get hate mail for this too, but I'm, I'm a big boy. I can take it. Um, serum. Mm -hmm. serum right these these cfl colors that yeah. switch right they're kind of cool they're kind of maybe a bit gimmicky but you know they're they're cool i guess i'm kind of on the fence but i'm like who sat down and thought you know what we need guys we need a color that goes from piss like urine to pink let's do that let's sell it and and let's make a ton of money it's not a sexy color to me and i know it's like a personal thing but this whole like 
piss to pink transition, I'm sorry. It doesn't really do it for me. But Yeah, well, you know, man, to let the cat out the bag, I don't know how many people are aware of this, but purple amethyst, Chinese purple, uh-huh. is the original CFL color. And <laughs> it was something that I had really didn't know that it was a CFL. Like, I've, I've always worked in the same lighting most of my career, some kind of, like, natural sure. light bulb of some sort, you know, so... That right. color's always been purple. And over at the mouse house, I'm, I'm, I'm going downstairs to get some stock to make some purple flowers. And I'm like searching and searching and I can't find the fucking purple. I'm like, what the fuck? All I'm seeing is like this light blue. And I look at the <laughs> yes. box and I'm like, purple amethyst. Are you fucking kidding me? So, <laughs> so I grab it and I'm walking up the stairs and I shit you not, man, that rod is all of a sudden turning purple as I'm getting upstairs closer to this natural light. That's and I awesome. was like, motherfucker. <laughs> So I made a, made a bunch of flowers, and then I yes. I posted a, pic, a little video on Instagram and like walked in and out from the stock room into the the our main shop where the light changes. Yeah. And I was like, "That's original CFL." And my brother commented on there just kind of jokingly. He's like, "Oh man, you're letting out all of our secrets." But <laughs> it's true. It's like Chinese purple. Like for a long time, when like when Purple Rain came out, as like I think Purple Rain was like one of our first hype colors. You know, like when the hype started yep. on colors. And yeah. and people were buying the Chinese purple and trying to pass it off as purple rain, and it's such a different color. There's like no bubbles in the Chinese purple where like the purple rain does, so you can tell yeah. the difference. And it also works differently. However, the purple amethyst is a CFL, and I don't know how many people actually realized it was until maybe not at all, or maybe they do now because they're hearing this, or they just all of a sudden caught right. on to it. But you know, it's it's. I think the one thing about that type of shit that I find interesting is it it. It puts a little spin on the glass, but it also gives you a chance to play yeah. with it to see what else you can mix it with to make that stuff change colors. Which, you, like you're exactly. saying, with these little boutique companies that are coming out are playing now with the concepts of something going from like a gray to a pink. Like I think it's freaking grad. It's like just the the, yeah. the alchemy side of the science side of things. I think is what to me is intriguing about the fact that this stuff changes. You know, and you Absolutely. can take advantage of the situation. Like I'm trying to to uh, get my company to let me start making figment. Um, and because oh, cool. as a purple dragon, but he's because of the whole figment of your imagination. If I'm using this purple amethyst, he will change from the blue to the purple, and we can set up a little booth or you know whatever set up in our shops that we have like a light that changes and alternates from one spectrum to the next, so you can see him changing colors. Right. You know those kind of fun things are great ways to market your work. It doesn't mean you got to make everything out of that fucking color, you know. But it, you know. totally. Yep. I, I again. I, I definitely see. I see the value of it. I see the merit of it. But actually, we probably lost all our viewers right now. Everybody, all our <laughs> listeners are. They're all going to get some fucking purple amethyst quickly. And right. It's going to be sold out. Well, now dude, it's going to be two hundred dollars a pound. It was so already raised. That. That, that, that was kind of my point before with the purple rain. Like once that, <laughs> that once the purple rain came out, purple amethyst, man, they they fucking jacked the price on that shit because you couldn't keep of it course. in stock. Of course they did. I mean, (laughs) of course. So it's it's cool. It's neat. It's a trick. It's gimmicky, but it can be incredibly powerful, and it can be a tool in your tool belt. I totally get that. With respect to serum, though, again, I just don't think that's a very sexy shift. It's dramatic, and it's cool. But again, I'm just like, eh. It's a personal thing, and it's okay. Similarly with these UV colors, you know, it's... Mm -hmm. um, it's in vogue, and, and they come, they're available, and then they're not available. We have the whole cadmium crisis. I mean, as a line worker, as a guy who's very reversal heavy in his work and who relies on encasement, that sucked, man. It sucked to be able to, to come back and not be able to find those crayon colors because those are valuable. <laughs> I was lucky enough to have a good friend, you know, Jesse James and, and Beth Cole, or Beth James now. Um, they're in, they're millie makers, and they're local, and so they had this huge stock of cadmiums grateful that I could go down there and just kind of pull from the shelf and use what I needed. But yeah. um, it's color is incredible. Our color palette has expanded so much and it's neat. It's neat to see this. Um, you, so you kind of have to educate yourself though too. Like with some of these transparent colors, it's like, uh, kind of looks like a watered down cadmium to me mm-hmm. and we're paying double and we're paying, you know, you kind of got to know, know it for what it is. And, um, Another thing, too, some of these classic colors, I think, are kind of neglected. I agree. So I, yeah. I, teach, I teach a class. I teach beginner glass blowing just to be part of this community, to help our community grow. So we do a lot of pendant making. We do a lot of marble making. One of my favorite colors to use in this class is that classic North Star yellow, the transparent yellow. It mm-hmm. looks completely clear from the start a striking color and you can develop a really beautiful yellows with a little bit of luster you combine that with a classic ruby a classic dark orange a classic amber purple 
add a little bit of clear to it, and you have so much life and so much movement and so much beautiful colors, right? Well, I don't see a lot of glass blowers using North Star yellow, transparent yellow. No, they want fucking terps, or they want uh, they want a raindrop. They want this and that, and I'm like, hmm, okay, I get it, I get it, but boy, you could have a similar look with like a cobalt too if you wanted to do a little coil potting or you could, I don't know. I, yeah. My larger point here is don't forget the classics. Yeah. So many people are caught up in the hype train and that's fine too. Well, the like I wonder how many people man. are using turbo cobalt. <laughs> I know. Turbo cobalt was the black of choice back in the day. Yeah. Like that's what we used because some of the blacks were so violent and so shitty and they'd oxidize so much even though there was encasement that turbo cobalt was pretty much as black as we could get yeah that's what we that's what we'd use in our little uh not even stick stacks we just blew open funnels and painted lines in it yeah dude, like, that was like that was my go-to fucking production <laughs> color for everything like a little bit of turbo yeah. cobalt and some silver fume man you can make all kind of badass stuff boom it's amazing turbo cobalt is a powerful color a lot of people don't realize it hey um maybe if when they run out of their purple amethyst they'll realize right. purple cobalt is, is, a, is a wonderful color well it's also um, nice because if you're if you're like a struggling getting started bootstrapping glass blower buy like a pound of that shit and a case of clear yes and you can get 25 different shades of blue out of that stuff absolutely you know? and, and you get a ton of knowledge too in terms of mixing colors yeah. and um yeah there's 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 so much value there. I, I hope people do that. Another color, too, which is old and often neglected, two of them, very similar, Irid um, mm-hmm. and Turquista. Turquista, I mean, they're in the cobalt spectrum, right? But they have a little bit different chemistry, a little bit more metallic. You can develop a little bit more luster. But here's a pro tip. To, people probably know this, and some people don't. But Turquista, with a tiny bit of gold fuming, just a touch, will give you the most beautiful emerald green dots you've ever seen in your life. Hmm. So slight fuming over Turquisa, whether it's just a touch of silver, not metallic, just barely silver, add a little bit of gold on that. Um, apply your fuming in different spots so you get different blendings of you know the silver and the gold composition. And then encase that with clear, and you will blow your fucking mind. You will have never seen dots. So brilliant, so gem-like in their quality. And it's this old color you can probably get for $15, $20 a pound, especially yeah. if you get odds. So if you're going to coil pot it anyway or you're going to encase it or do whatever, fuck, go with the odds. Go with the seconds. Yeah. Get it for next to nothing and blow people away. I'd love to see some of these old colors kind of be used again and to you know be made relevant but yeah who knows? yeah i agree like amber purple is still <laughs> one of my old go-to's like i love that whole family of amber purple colors and a lot of artists i interview on the show they're the same way like a lot of them are yeah. older older artists like us but you know it's like an old yep. go-to or even like you know the, the mai tai pinks and some of the newer yeah. versions of them are awesome too but like it's that whole family of amber purple is like you cannot go wrong ever with that stuff no, it's super sexy, and it gives you a chance to to use different flame chemistries, right? Specifically yep. amber purple, because it'll develop such a luster on it that you'll need to use a, a certain flame to get that luster off. So you'll see that full spectrum, you know, the, the full range of what amber purple can do to you. So you need to, you have to use the right flame, too. I mean, I use Carlisle torches. I have a bunch of different torches, but I am old school. So my main go-to torch is a Carlisle CC burner. Oh, a lot yeah. of people say, oh, you're crazy. You're crazy. You need to be on Team GTT. You need this. <laughs> well, guess what? I have GTT torches. I have a Phantom. I have a Mirage. I have access to any GTT technology I want. But I use what's comfortable for me. And so depending on what tool you have, you're going to interact with that color differently. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, specific to your amber-purple thing, <laughs> yeah. Play with it. Play with amber purple for a day and see the whole range of colors you can get from it. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, and it also teaches the kiln cycles and stuff too, to like understanding how hot to get your kiln to get some of those colors to come out or not to get them to come out, you know. Exactly. Yeah, we'd have to man, for some of those old rubies, especially the old North Star and the dark orange, we'd have to ramp our kilns up to eleven hundred just to get them to strike. Yeah. If if you didn't flame strike, right? So if you were dependent on your kiln to develop that color, some of those old uh, you know, colors required a kiln setting of 1100, which is pretty hot, right? Mm-hmm. That's on the hotter side of, <laughs> of where you want to be. And um, when you're doing production glass blowing, it's just not feasible to flame strike every piece. Yeah. So you have to put it in the kiln, and then you have to learn what can your kiln do. So you're right on. You're spot on with that. Um, 
there's so much to learn in this industry. It's so fun. Yeah, I know. I love it. I'm learning something every day. And now, like, I'm I'm uh, working in the hot shop over at the Mouse House right now. I've been now five nice. five weeks. This is week six for me, and it's it's crazy because I'm going from that that hot shop, you know, tech yep. technique, hand skilled, different kind of glass, the whole nine yards, and then like. I'll do that for three days in a row, and then the next day I go to my other shop, and I'm working Boro. And last week mm-hmm. when I did that, it literally took me two days to get my Boro swag back. Like, the first day I was like... Really? Yeah, dude, it was crazy. Like, I, I was making manatees and dolphins. Like, I've made them 100,000 times, and it's like, <laughs> it took me two fucking days. So I've got a little bit of flair for my show that I do. Okay. And And just to get my my flair swag back, it took... I mean, literally, it took me two days to get that group Yay. going. It was crazy. Now, this weekend was a little bit different because I was back in the groove a little bit easier i don't know what it's just time you know muscle memory thing but mm-hmm. yeah man it was crazy just going from the from one thing to the next it was it's 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 cool because i'm also developing better hand skills from the hot shop that i'm carrying over yeah. into my torch work which i recommend again anybody that wants to get their, their hand skills together and understand glass in general go take a weekend yeah. class or just go you know have someone tandem with you and make an ornament or some shit just to understand this this medium is so fucking different in so many different ways Absolutely, you know, and it is le- like legitimately hands on when you're in that hot shop. Yeah. You know, when you when you can grab that folded up wet newspaper and physically be you know a half inch, one inch away from this molten glob of glass, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, it's I sketchy. Mean, you're, you're, yeah, it's sketchy. You're feeling it. You're feeling the heat radiate from it. You're smelling it. I mean, there's so much about that experience that is different from what we do as borosilicate glass workers. You know, just the standard bench work versus that offhand, hot, amazing soft glass approach, which is really on a different scale as well. Mm-hmm. Although there are borosilicate guys out there that are clearly pushing the limits of what's possible with these Dude, giant like, Yeah, I've seen the shit Marcel's doing right now. It's like, <laughs> I'm just, Incredible. It's, it's just fucking crazy. I, I, I see some of those poles, you know, these milli poles and these other things that are going from you know, a second story down to the main level. And I see guys like Marcel, you know, standing a foot away from this giant fucking pole that's glowing red hot. And I think to myself, how is his shirt not on fire? Like, (laughs) I know how hot that is. And there he is with no protection and his little hat. And it's so cute and so awesome. I love it. I know. I know. I'm like, how is he not on fire? Because when I do my vac stacks, and uh, a lot of the prep that's required for the type of glass blowing that I do, you know, I'm using 80 millimeter plugs, or 80 millimeter outer, you know, sleeves by let's say about 10 inches. And I mean, it's incredible the amount of radiant energy that comes off mm-hmm. of that, right? And that's just with my little CC burner. A lot of people will say, no, Cruz, you need a GTT, you need a Ninja, you need a Delta. Dude, I've been rocking my CC for 18 fucking years, bro, and it's still Thank fire. Thank you. Okay, so that, there you go. We're going to get hate mail because we pull points and because we use Carlisle technology. Yeah, and mine's so, got, yeah, right. <laughs> and mine's got a bunch of clogged ports. Like my 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 stu- my apprentice, I'm I, where I, I'm at his house now, working out of. He's always like, "Bro, your torch dry," because he's got like he's got a brand new CC, and oh, it's nice. like you know, mine's got a bunch of clogged holes, and I'm like, I know my torch. It's sure she's a little yep. beat up, but I know how she rocks, and I'm making some big fucking stuff on it. I don't give a shit. That's awesome. Yeah, and and you can. It's all about. Here's my golden rule, right? When I talk to new people or even even established people in the industry that have much more credentials and much more power than I do, I get heat. I get people that say, oh, I wouldn't use a Carlisle because they're dirty, because they're loud, because they pop, they snarl, they hiss. Um, you need a GTT. You need this and that. And I step back and I say to myself, I don't think so. I think what you need is heart. Mm-hmm. I think what you need is hand skill. I think what you need is drive. The tools don't make the man, okay? Now, that's not to say the tools can't be incredibly helpful, but the notion that all one needs is this certain torch at this certain price point to be successful, that is fucking offensive to me, and it's bullshit. And yeah. I get it. I, yeah. get, I get how people fall in these different camps, right? Um, here's what I don't want to be, and here's what I would encourage people to not be. Don't be that 16-year-old kid who gets a fucking Porsche for his first car. Don't be that kid who, like, you know, oh, I got the best car, and then you end up in a fucking ditch because you don't know how to use the tool that yeah, you've exactly. got. Okay? So I teach a lot of my beginners um, on a Bethlehem Alpha. It's a single-stage torch, surface mix, right? Very basic, and it's incredible. We pull two, two-and-a-half-inch marbles off of a Bethlehem Alpha. Hell yeah. Um, I continue to use my Carlisle CC burner daily, and I prep 
80 mil vac stacks, 80 mil by, I don't know, eight to 10 inches. So about two thirds of a color rod fits in, a shitload of color in there. Uh, it's hot, it's loud, um, and it works. Yeah. It works for me. I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, exactly. It's like, fuck you, don't tell me what to do. And we could speak to GTT and their customer service and their wait list and all that other stuff too, which to me isn't very nice. I'm like, oh my God, I can call Carlisle right now. And I can get a torch in two days. Yeah, and and that's amazing. Yeah, so. like I I get it, but at the same time I don't. You know. It's like, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. I'll, have, I'll have the patience for it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it, it's different tools. Uh, every tool is going to have its strengths and its weaknesses. And now, specific to me and what I do, I find the versatility that I need out of my CC burner. Yeah. Doesn't mean I you you know uh, a GTT might work fine for me it's just not my thing uh, i love herbies too they're so sexy it's mm-hmm. like the most incredible looking machine and actually when i was in ithaca la what about six weeks ago working with carl termini i got to play on his herbie and it was amazing and i took to it very quickly and i was like awesome great here we go herbies herbies are wonderful but when i got home you know it's just uh here i am with my old friend yeah, exactly <laughs> operate this thing with my eyes closed i don't have to look at it I know how to modulate these valves without even thinking about it. Yeah. And so don't be that 16-year-old kid who gets a fucking Porsche for his first car. You oh, know yeah, what I mean? Dude. Don't be don't be caught up in the trappings of ego and what other people tell you. Develop the skills, have the heart, and, and, and then go for it. Then see what tools you need. So whether that's GTT or Carlisle, it's okay. Yeah, dude. I think that's, uh, that's really smart. And also, uh, just looking at time-wise, I think it'd be a good time for us to take a quick break. And uh, thank our sponsors, and then we'll come back and we'll crash the kiln. (laughs) This segment of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Zen Dude Fitness. Lose 10 pounds this month by joining the Zen Dude Fitness 4-Week Jump Rope Fat Loss Challenge. Brandon and Dan will take you on a guided journey towards becoming the best you. Get fit, have fun, and find new ways to eat healthy while still enjoying the sweeter side of life. Just takes 20 to 30 minutes a day and no gym required. For more info and to sign up for the free four-week challenge, go to wiseguymedia.com forward slash zen dude fitness. That's wiseguymedia.com forward slash zen dude fitness. All right, man. So the Crash in the Kiln round consists of seven questions. And uh, you can give me a 30 to 60 second answer or expound upon them as we always do. And uh, the first question I always like to ask, if there is living, any living glass artist that you haven't worked with yet, uh, who is it that you want to work with and why? Oh, okay, cool. I'm going to give you a few different answers because there's so many people that I respect and love. First of all, Cameron Burns. I love Cameron Burns. He, we're kindred spirits, right? He's a line worker. He's out there pushing the boundaries of what you can do in terms of reversals and line work. Not only that, Cameron has cool shoes. He just seems cool. I'd love to work with Cameron. He's awesome. Again, Kajbeck is an incredible millie maker. I'd love to work with him someday or at least shake his hand. Um, Yushin, of course, he's a stud. He impresses me so much with what he does. He's a human lathe, and he's an incredible person in our industry. So he has my respect. And the last two that I would probably say really interests me right now and I, and I just have so much respect for Kevin Murray Kevin Murray's hand skills his filicellos some of the stuff he's doing mm-hmm. blows me away I love Kevin Murray and I love John Dosa Dosa Glass I love people who can slam line work for example with Dosa like Reticello he can slam it over these these uh, cane builds these milli builds and he can get so much life um, out of his piece. So those are guys who are impressive to me. Those are people I'd love to work with. Moreover than just wor- than just working with them, those are people that I really respect in the industry. I think they're good humans. Hell yeah. So that's yeah. Nice. What are your uh, yeah. top five favorite colors in glass? Ooh. So that's not serum. (laughs) (laughs) We'll give you six. That's uh, a negative one. So you get six colors now. (laughs) (laughs) Little bonus. Okay. So being a line worker, I use very classic colors. I I be very crayon based, a lot of cadmiums. Some of the colors that have been impressing me lately, (sighs) be 
because I, it's hard to pick favorites. It's really hard to pick favorites. Mm-hmm. But some of these colors that I've been incorporating lately and getting really beautiful patterns with would include that, what, bippity boppity blue. Mm-hmm. I think that's a pretty fun one. Turquoise is a classic. Aqua Azul is a classic. I love the Neocads, the new ones. I love OJ. I love Ketchup. Um, and then also Iris. So kind of mm-hmm. playing in that kind of that blue green spectrum is really fun for me these days and to get in and, and to stack up these color rods and, and really get different blends out of them that's sweet because man you have so many opportunities to mix colors and, and create awesome patterns when it comes to reversals in spiral work so those are some of the ones that i'm working with lately and i hate serum let's just throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hell yeah so yeah. uh what is your worst injury in the studio Oh, man. Okay, so this is funny. <laughs> I'll give you two, but you want the worst. Okay, but I'll, well, I'll give take you a them funny both. one. Yeah, I'll take okay, two. Okay, sweet. So uh, a couple weeks ago, I'm making this double bubbler. I'm in the kiln. I'm doing some kind of finishing work <laughs> on, on the piece in the kiln, and it's, you know, I'm kind of squatting down, and I'm peeking in the kiln, and I have a couple different hand torches I use, and, you know, they're usually on, and they're sitting on your bench, and so I think you can see where I'm going with this. I'm peeking in the kiln, and I kind of move my head to the left, and I introduced my face to my hand torch while it was on. Um, Little hand torch, Smith, right to the cheek. Boom, you know, torch pops, flame goes out. And I smell my flesh, and I'm like, ooh, that wasn't that much fun. So very boneheaded injury, my most recent one, and now I have this awesome scar on my face. So we'll we'll see how that resolves. But (laughs) even better than that, my worst injury is so stupid. Okay. This is years ago. This is when I was using 100-pound propane tanks to kind of fuel the torch, right? Kind of a bigger shop format. So we've got these 100-pound propane tanks that have those collars on the top to protect the valve, right? Mm -hmm. And you'd spin them off. And in the process of changing tanks one day, I'm spinning that little collar off the top of it, which weighs, what, 5 or 10 pounds? They're kind of heavy, maybe 7 pounds. And I dropped the fucking thing on my foot. Now, I was wearing flip-flops. And once it hit my foot, I realized that I had broken a toe or two toes. Very, I mean, it was just so obvious. It was instant pain. I hopped around. I couldn't talk. The pain wouldn't stop. <laughs> I hopped my ass through my house onto my bed. And I sat and I writhed in pain for probably 8 to 10 hours and couldn't sleep that night because I had broken the shit out of my toes with a fucking propane collar Jesus. that I dropped from probably 4 feet high. So... <sighs> It was a dumb move. It was a boneheaded move, and I just won't wear flip flops in the shop again. You know, oh man, wear, dude, flip flops in the shop like that's my classic footwear. But man, <laughs> it's, it's dumb. It's, it's the things that you don't think of oh. that are inevitably. Gonna hey, you're breaking up. Shop. Your phone's breaking oh, up. Can you hear me okay right now? No, you're breaking up a little bit. Okay, let's try it here. How about right now? Nope, still weird. Still weird. That's still weird because I haven't changed anything. Uh, yeah, strange. I'll try a different phone. Hold on. Can you hear me okay with this one? Yep. How's that? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, good. So maybe those batteries were gone. But yeah, to to finish up that point, um, it's the things in the shop that you're not aware of, that you're not conscious of, that will inevitably jump out and bite you. You know, it's not the it's not the hot torch that's going to melt your hand, it's the marble mold sitting next to you that you forgot that you just soaked with (laughs) thousand degree glass and then you reach across your table and you fry your arm. Um, Those absent-minded mistakes, you know, those are what get you. Yeah, exactly. The hot torch, so. (laughs) Yeah, typically that's when I burn myself is from a hot tool because I get asked every day, you burn yourself? How many times you burn? I'm like, dude, I burn myself every fucking day. But usually it's like, (laughs) you know, something stupid like you're saying, like a hot tool or whatever or like a hot Honey, you touched another rod that I didn't realize it was touching it. I go to grab the rod, you know. Oh yeah. You know, it sucks. But you know, on the point of the of the flip flop thing, years ago when I was my first experience in the hot shop, um, that morning I was at my studio working, and I don't know what happened, but something broke off that was hot, and it hit my my studio floor, and I'm looking for it, and I go to step back and had realized it had gotten stuck between my flip flop and my foot. So when I stepped down <laughs> on my flip flop, it went you know sandwiched between my that and my foot. <laughs> and it literally stuck my flip flop to my foot with this fucking hot glass, and it was like right in the uh. arch of my foot on top of it all. And this is like an hour before I'm getting ready to go to the hot shop, so I'm like, all right, <laughs> this fucking sucks. So I put you know bandaid on it, threw some socks and shoes on because I know in the hot shop I need to wear shoes. 
And, uh, you know, of course I should have worn shoes in my regular studio too, but you know, that's a whole different topic. But, uh, yeah, dude. And that that was probably that, that blister probably took me the longest to heal just because of the, where it was at. And the fact that I went to the hot shop immediately afterwards and got all sweaty and gross and, oh man, I'm I'm lucky I have a foot still. (laughs) Let's not do that again, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. I'll keep my face away from the mini source and you stop stepping on marble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's fun. Awesome. Hell yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> so uh, when you're in the shop, do you watch TV, listen to the radio, or do you do both? Okay, both. Um, I stream a lot of music um, through primarily like Apple or Spotify. I think that that's com- probably the bulk of my time. It's just listening to music, um, but I do have a TV, and I use it largely to watch baseball. I love baseball, and I love that the game takes so long. So I can watch the pregame, the postgame, and I can eat at four hours and just absentmindedly burn half a day. And, um, you know, you look up when something cool happens, and the rest of the time you're looking at your piece of glass. But more than more than watching TV, music. Music is so important. And that would include your podcast. That would include Thanks, um, books on tape. That would include just good old-fashioned rock and roll. So, yeah, music for sure. Hell yeah. And when speaking of books on tape, to kind of do a little plug, if you guys haven't yet signed up for audibletrial.com, uh, you can get a free 30-day trial and a free audiobook just by uh, signing up. And just go to audibletrial.com forward slash wiseguyradio. Awesome. Yeah. I got the, those shameless plugs in there every once in a while. Yeah, you got to do it. That's sweet. But yeah, man, baseball for me is the same way. I, I got I, our local sports radio guys are like, even with hockey too, they're, but they're all like just top notch. So I, I love that having that. Cause like you're saying, it's like a good four hour window, but also right. rest, wrestling is the same way for me too. Like I don't, I don't necessarily watch it while I'm working all Like I'll just love listening to the commentary and the shit talking and whatever else. You going mean on. like current, like WWE type oh, yeah. wrestling? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I've subscribed to their network and shit. It's like 10 bucks a month and I get like 40,000 hours of wrestling. I've been watching that shit since like fifth grade. So I'm all about like yeah, the story was... and that kind of shit too. Yeah. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I kind of grew a, apart from that. But I have to say, like, my formative years being a young man, Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, Randy the Macho Man Savage, Jake the Snake Roberts, all those guys were my hero. Hell yeah. I mean, it was so fun. And I had a neighbor who actually had a wrestling ring. So I dragged my little fucking 80-pound ass in that ring, you know, when I'm in third grade or whatever, and we'd rip our shirts off and we'd beat each other up and we'd – jump from the top turnbuckle and it was so fun that's awesome (laughs) fuck yeah so uh another question here is do you have any glass blowing themed tattoos no i don't i do scars count as tattoos (laughs) probably not (laughs) i have a really nice face tattoo right Right. now and i call it the smith mini um yeah it's a good rule. Don't introduce your face too many times. It no. doesn't feel good. And you you kind of look stupid, too. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's, not, like, it's not a good look. Yeah, it's got to be a story. People are like, what the fuck did he do to his face? Oh, my God. Is that herpes I or know. something? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's this wonderful linear uh, line, and I guess it kind of makes me look badass. So i I got to live with it now. Yeah, dude, better than a teardrop or some shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so funny and uh final question for you is what are your five current favorite tools that you use besides your torch Ooh, okay besides the torch well i have to give credit again because i love carlisle machine work so i'm going to give them a shameless plug okay i think carlisle makes an incredible machine so i love the cc burn other than that i think you'd be pretty surprised that I have everything I need and nothing I don't. So my daily um, drivers would include a basic carbon rod or reamer, right? Mm -hmm. You got to have a carbon rod. Um, Secondly, um, disc rollers. I need disc rollers just to take take some of the weight, especially during some of these vac stacks because I have a lathe. I have a Litton HSJ, but I don't use it often. I'm still kind of waiting to incorporate more lathe work into my production line. So everything I do, I pull off the bench. I pull it off by hand. So my disc roller is incredibly important to me. Also, my bench rollers. Okay, so as I'm prepping this, these 80 mil, these 50 mil, these 75 mil tubes, 
I need a bench roller because it's just not feasible to crack, you know, a five foot section of 80 mil by hand. Yeah. It does. It doesn't work. Right. So I need those things. Other than that, I have, um, I have a couple paddles that I use very regularly, like a small and kind of a larger size paddle that are super important to me. I use those things constantly. They're amazing. Um, my philosophy is generally less is more in terms of tools. We want tools that are good multitaskers, right? These, these kind of unitaskers that only have one purpose. Yeah. I, I don't see a lot of value in those. I want, I want maximum power for every tool I have. So if you came to my shop, it's a very nice shop, but you'd probably be underwhelmed by the amount of tools I use. Um, and that's okay. Like if I want to sculpt a marble, right, or if I want to round something out, for me, it's about hand skill. It's about using the torch and about using gravity to create the shape that I want. So I'm not dependent on a marble mold to do that final shaping. Nothing against marble molds, but if I want it round, I want to know how to do that by hand. Mm -hmm. So I, enc I encourage my students to be able to do that, whether it's a simple gather or a rollback. Let's learn how to make that fuck around by hand. And then as we get bigger and we incorporate color into things, well, then we can use the mold kind of as an assist to help speed up that meltdown and to speed up the shape. But let's not be dependent upon the tool to get there all the time, right? So there you go. There's the basics. That's what I use. You know, and I have a very basic kiln, a Paragon F-130, and then I have a F-240. You've got to have that. So that kind of rounds out my collection, you know, of my my go-to torches nice. you've got your car your carlisle your carbon rod your disc rollers your bench rollers a couple paddles and a wonderful kiln and that's all a growing boy needs to succeed in this industry yeah. you don't need a you don't need a forty thousand dollar lathe you don't need a six thousand dollar torch you don't you know what i mean you need heart and hand skill yep. so let me reinforce that one more time <laughs> yeah exactly yeah dude yeah. i mean i love seeing people crank out some amazing stuff on a red max yes you know? It's so it's so doable. And and uh, when we first got started, we'd use national blowpipes, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. Reab yeah. classic national. Well, it's so nice now that I start to incorporate more lathe working into my repertoire. Boom! There's the national. Yep. It's amazing. Yeah. It's an incredible premix torch, single jet, variety of tips. You can do so much with that torch. It's awesome. Yeah, it's killer. Hell yeah, dude! Before we let you go, then it's uh it's been a pleasure talking to you too, and. Uh, to have you know, we went all over the place, but I think we covered a lot of good topics. We did, yeah. yeah. Thank, thanks so much for your time. I had, I had a wonderful, I had a wonderful time, and it's just, it's just a pleasure to get to know you a little bit better and to get to share who I am and what I'm about with, with your audience. You know, I'll give a shameless plug to me and to myself. If you want to get to know more about me, find me on Instagram. Find me at Sunsea Glass. That's S U N S I Glass, and make an introduction my social media experience is about engaging people it's about getting to know people so rather than just a follow how about you make an introduction because guess what i want to get to know you and i want you to get to know me so that's beautiful important. hell yeah man yeah. well said and uh with that being said if you i mean you just gave us some good advice but uh if you have any other parting piece of advice you want to throw out there hmm absolutely <laughs> let's reinforce a couple of other things too Build your business, build it organically, and build it through engagement, right? I think it's increasingly more important for me to develop the business side than it is to develop the, the flame working side. And so I kind of have to find this balance between torch time and business time. And you can do that too. And you have so many tools at your disposal, whether it's old school classic farming, right? Knocking on doors and making phone calls whether it's using social media, whether it's trade shows. Um, those are just three, but those are three incredibly powerful tools to help any artist, any craftsman build their business, build their brand. And uh, lastly, when it comes to social media, don't just be present. Be thoughtful. Engage people. Get to know people. I think you'll find a tremendous amount of success building your brand that way organically, one follower at a time versus buying followers and posturing and potentially being fake. Um, get out there, build your business, meet people. It's possible. It's doable. You guys have the tools. So good luck. Hell yeah. Well said. 
Well, hell yeah, man. We'll hang on after I say goodbye. We'll say goodbye off the air here. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, I hope you all enjoyed our conversation with Chris Oz. You can find him again on Instagram at Sunsea Glass. That's S U N S I Glass. And I'll have him on the links in the show notes and all that good stuff. And I uh, hope you guys learned a lot. We definitely covered a lot of bases and filled in some blanks. And we got lots more to talk about. So, we'll be definitely bringing Chris back on to uh, further discuss maybe some flame properties and annealing cycles and all the things that you've learned, you know, through this process, especially being an educator yourself, dude. So I definitely appreciate all the, all the knowledge you've been dropping today. It's been, been fun. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much for your time. Hell yeah. And y'all have a beautiful day. Happy Melton. And we'll talk to you next time on the Wise Guy Radio Show. Take it easy. Peace. Peace. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by The Flow Magazine. Since its inception, the focus of The Flow has been to provide a bond among members of the lamp working community. In every issue, you can enjoy great content with the hottest artists and cutting-edge techniques using the latest industry products. These features, along with the continuation of our Women in Glass edition, Glass Craft Immersion Artist Awards, inspiring gallery showcases, dynamic general interest articles, as well as health and safety information, make The Flow the leading international lampworking journal. For more information or to subscribe to The Flow, go to theflowmagazine.com. That's theflowmagazine.com.